So good morning, everybody. Good evening. Good uh, good uh, good evening. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to the Glopedar uh, Research Synergies meeting. On behalf of uh, Glopedar, welcome. I welcome everybody. We have over two hundred people joining us today. Hopefully, uh, and uh, this is the last summary and discussion panel session of this series, which has covered vaccines, therapeutics, transmission, social sciences. So this is the final panel discussion and summaries from all those sessions. So I'm looking forward to a great session. Uh, and then it gives me a great pleasure to invite my co-chair, uh, Dr. Yazdin Yazdin Panau, who is the director of INSERM Reacting Consortium, uh, an INSERM Institute of Infectious Disease, Microbiology and Immunology, uh, to give us a very brief overview of Glopedar, uh, in case some of you are not familiar with the organization. Uh, my name is Charu Kaushik, and I'm the scientific director of the Institute of Infection and Immunity at Canadian Institutes of Health Research. So, Yazdin, over to you. Thanks a lot, Charu, uh, and thanks uh, uh, to everyone for joining us uh, this uh, um, afternoon, morning, or evening. Um, I wanted, first of all, uh, to introduce the, the meeting to give you a few the slides on Glopid R. Next slide, please. Uh, so Glopid R is the global research collaboration for infectious diseases preparedness uh, in an international network of research funding organization. It was launched in 2013 to facilitate, accelerate, and deepen collaboration among research uh, funders in emerging diseases. Through investments to strengthen global research preparedness between crises, although with time we know that we don't really have between crises, to mobilize resources to respond rapidly and effectively uh, uh, to significant uh, infectious disease uh, outbreaks. Uh, uh, next slide. Please. Uh, so, uh, Glopid R have 29 members and two uh, uh, observers, among which uh, uh, WHO. And as you can see, uh, there are countries uh, from all around the world, and there are funders uh, uh, of different uh, 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 countries, different continents, and different regions. Next slide. Uh, uh, since the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, uh, uh, there have been an important response of Glopid R to it members, observers, and stakeholders that have been mobilized in the response. Uh, by first collecting information on what were existing research activities, in particular in viral respiratory diseases, uh, through uh, close collaboration with WHO and WHO Blueprint, uh, in particular for setting up priorities and uh, uh, for assisting them to set up a uh, roadmap. Uh, and uh, in uh, particular, uh, in the February meeting at WHO that was co-organized co by with Glopid R. Uh, uh, Glopid R members have launched emerging calls uh, uh, and what we have tried at least to do is to coordinate funders to optimize resources, to avoid duplication, and uh, to uh, our best to cover priorities that were listed in the roadmap. Uh, in February, when we started to work uh, 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 together in this coordination, we thought that it would be extremely important uh, to try to gather um, those researchers that have been funded in July or June to try to see where they are, to try to have a meeting with them, and to try to identify at that point the gaps. And that was the aim of this meeting, uh, the access that uh, were chosen. Uh, so we have had, as Charu said, uh, four of those meetings on treatment, vaccine, social science, and transmission that were very fruitful uh, 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 meetings with more than 200 uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, participants at each time, at each session. And today, the idea was really to try to, based on that, find some cross-cutting, some transdisciplinary uh, 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 ideas, and to try uh, furthermore to identify gaps. Thanks for your attention, and thanks to all those who have helped a lot to organize uh, these meetings and these sessions. Charu? Thank you, Yazdin. So uh, yeah, just a couple of uh, brief housekeeping notes to make sure that the meeting runs smoothly. So uh, except for the panelists and speakers, uh, everybody else's uh, microphones and uh, videos will stay turned off. The session is being recorded and it will be put on YouTube so that it's available for people to look at at a later time point. Uh, and then uh, just to facilitate uh, easiness, if you could put your questions and answers that you want to address to the co-chairs who will be presenting summaries or panelists at a later point, please put it in the QA box, not in the chat box. The chat box is available for open discussions among uh, the participants. We actually encourage that, uh, but we will be looking and monitoring only the Q&A box. For the panelists who cannot uh, use the um, Q&A box, just put it in the chat box for panelists and the uh, uh, meeting coordinators will pick up and put that back into the Q&A. Uh, and uh, along with Yazdin, I would like to uh, thank the, uh, take this opportunity to thank the large team behind the scenes who has really uh, picked up and done this, pulled this all together in a matter of a month. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Evelyn Deporte from uh, European Commission, from Welcome Trust, Josie Golding, Jaurangel de Almeida, uh, from CHR, Genevieve Boily LaRouche, uh, from INSERM, Claire Madeline, and from the Secretariat, uh, Richard Waugh and Christine uh, and uh, Gail. Uh, and a special shout out to our technician, uh, Zamesh Abdel, who has been absolutely fantastic and without whom we couldn't have done this in such a short time. Uh, so with that, um, I will introduce uh, our uh, co-chairs for the uh, first uh, summary uh, that is going to be provided. Uh, the first uh, co-chairs will be from the vaccine session. Uh, so the co-chairs for this session were Dr. Uh, Anita Zaidi, Dr. Melanie Seville, who really put, helped us uh, work with us to put the program together. Uh, unfortunately, neither one of them is here today and completely understandable. Uh, they have a lot of commitments uh, for COVID-19 right now. Uh, but with us is uh, Dr. Deborah Yeski, who also substituted for Melanie during the actual session. Uh, and uh, Deborah is uh, a doctor of pharmacy and is the head of regulatory affairs North America for CEPI. Uh, prior to joining CEPI, Deborah served as the director of the regulatory and quality affairs division with the biomedical uh, Advanced Research and Development Authority, BARDA, uh, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, uh, U.S. Department of H Human uh, Services and Health. Uh, so, and then uh, many of you know Anita, who is the Director of uh, Vaccine Development Surveillance and Antric Diarrheal Diseases for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and Dr. Melanie Seville, uh, who is the Director of Vaccine Development at CEPI. Uh, and I want to acknowledge and thank both Anita and Melanie for their contributions in developing this program for vaccine. Uh, and uh, Deborah for st uh, stepping in and, uh, you know, substituting for Melanie and uh, giving today's presentation. So Deborah, over to you. You have about 10 minutes to summarize the vaccine session. Great. Thank you, Chiru, and uh, thank you to my other uh, co-leads and, and especially for um, uh, thanking uh, Melanie uh, for inviting me to substitute for her. I'm privileged to, um, honored to do that. First slide, please. So last week, um, and thank you for everyone uh, attending today. So last week we had a very uh, fruitful uh, discussion on, on vaccines um, where we talked about um, that there are over 200 vaccine candidates in development uh, across the globe. Uh, and then uh, approximately uh, 60 or so will be entering uh, the clinic uh, by uh, the end of 2020. 
Um, and really, we're looking at a, a paradigm shift here. Uh, and as everyone or anyone knows about vaccine uh, manufacturing and development, uh, in and of itself in a traditional manner is, is not an easy task. And so uh, now we are uh, compressing and speeding things up and um, all while learning about this new virus. So um, it is daunting, uh, nevertheless. Um, so we also touched on uh, and had excellent um, uh, presentations on animal models and what we've what we've heard is that a combination of multiple multiple animal models um, will probably work best uh, and uh, the hamster uh, model is looking um, is looking good uh, and then the need for standardization assays and controls um, and standardization uh, on a lot of things will be the theme throughout um, uh, these uh, summary slides. Looking at the correlate of protection, uh, which is important, and, and again, learning. We're, we're on a very steep learning curve, all of us, um, and, and trying to do it um, thoroughly, intentionally, and um, with uh, transparency for sharing, which is very important. And, and goes to um, show that it's very important for forums like this and, and thank Glopid R for arranging um, these uh, sessions. Next slide, please. Um, okay, all right. Okay, so my, my slides were a little bit different, but that's okay. Um, uh, next, we, we talked about the clinical trials and, and regulatory uh, considerations and uh, you know, across uh, across the gamut, we're we're looking at you know standardization of clinical endpoints. How can we uh, look across a number of studies and to see what we can align with? Because it, it's a difficult task for um, you know for the variables uh, associated with the disease, the platform, um, and and trying to. Um, in, ensure that we have a, a, you know efficacy in the at the end here. So and and then what's near and dear to my heart is the harmonization of regulatory processes, um, and you know this this is no easy task as well. You know we're looking at um, and reaching out at least within Covax and we'll talk about that in my last slide is uh, you know. Uh, pulling together uh, regulators and looking at critical issues that are product agnostic um, uh, th for the, the vaccines that are in COVAX and, and actually all vaccines that can participate in that um, to look to see if we can uh, streamline as, as many things as possible, as well as um, getting information out to the developers. Um, so that that is that is that is very important and i think that um having any type of um you know points to consider will help developers out and um you know we're we're, we're striving to also help our regulators to if there's something that they need uh information with uh or help with that we can try to facilitate that um in a, a transparent and uh, global process. Also, the commitment to trial sites, uh, this, this is very challenging and um, we, we have been talking about this, this within our uh, clinical um, SWAT team in the COVAX as well as clinical operations and um, uh, that just, it, there's many challenges there and uh, we have pulled together a group of um, of people to talk about and talk through these these issues and bringing again collaborations like this and others together will only help um, try to uh, facilitate uh, that. Next slide, please. So manufacturing implementation and access, um, you know, putting together a portfolio approach. We, uh, you know, like I said. Over 200 um, vaccine candidates are uh, in development across the globe. Uh, 
I believe that there will, there will be a first vaccine licensed and available, but it will take more than one vaccine to uh, help us uh, end this um, uh, pandemic. So um, we're looking at manufacturing capacities, uh, you know, the uh, manufacturing at risk. Um, and then one of the most important things is advanced purchase commitment um, to reduce the um, investment um, fragmentation and, uh, and help will help the uh, fair allocation of vaccine across the globe. And then, you know, the, the other thing uh, that's very important is this, this commitment to equitable access and um, what goes along with um, manufacturing is uh, tech transfer and, you know, utilizing uh, our, our, our developers, not even with COVAX, but, but in other um, potential uh, groupings is that, you know, tech transfer, uh, as I said in the beginning, vaccine manufacturing is, uh, is fraught with um, uh, issues in manufacturing. Uh, and then add tech transfer to a number of different sites. So, you know, we're looking very closely at how tech transfer will go um, and um, making sure that that will be as, as seamless as possible. Next slide, please. So I think that the takeaways, again, we all agree. Uh, I think that uh, vaccines are our best exit strategy and uh, we will, um, you know, we're all striving to, to, to get to the finish line there. The important thing is um, global standardization and harmonization. And again, kudos to Globe at R for bringing uh, these sessions together and as we work together. Um, and then global access, uh, COVAX, which um, I spoke about uh, last week, uh, that's the, the aim of, of COVAX is to, to make sure that um, uh, vaccine manufacturers and developers uh, uh, have as seamless as possible um, uh, journey through their, their regulatory and development process and that we uh, tackle issues and um, questions in a product agnostic manner, we definitely have uh, the COVAX portfolio, but um, the information and everything that we generate um, uh, through the COVAX will be available to all vaccine manufacturers. And that the aim of, of uh, the COVAX is to uh, procure 100 million doses by the end of 2020 and 2 billion uh, by the end of 2021. And this really depends on uh, transparency and commitments from manufacturers and governments and, um, and organizations like GLOPIDAR and, and others. So um, I, I just uh, would say that we, we need to keep talking in forums like this, we need to keep sharing and we need to be transparent with each other because um, it's, it's uh, like I said, one, one vaccine will be first. But to win, we need to all win. And, and so uh, we need to keep sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. So that's a very nice summary. And uh, thank you for ending on that uh, note. I think this will be a theme about sharing throughout uh, our next few discussions. So uh, Yazdin is going to introduce the next set of co-chairs. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Cheru. So, the second session on which we focused on, on Friday, and of course it's a huge uh, domain on which we have been since the beginning, if, is of course uh, treatments and the therapeutic session. Uh, uh, so we have uh, 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 two fabulous uh, co-chairs for that, uh, for that uh, session. Uh, so Glenda Gray, that many of you know, professor of uh, 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 Randall Cray is the president and the CEO of the South African uh, Medical Research uh, Council. And, uh, uh, and she is also the chair of the research committee uh, on COVID-19 um, uh, to the Minister of Health and National Coronary uh, uh, Command Council. Uh, unfortunately, Glenda could not be here today 
and uh, 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 but um, she did a great job, and we have the the chance to have today Vardilea uh, Velezo uh, that uh, I thanks a lot. So, uh, Dr. Vardilea Velezo is the director of the National Institute of Infections at Fiocruz in Brazil. Uh, she is an infectious disease specialist and has served as an advisor for the Ministry of uh, Health in Brazil, as well as for many other international uh, bodies, such as uh, the Global Fund for HIV and TB and for malaria. Uh, so it's really a pleasure to have you today, Valdelea. Thanks again. And so for 10 minutes, uh, to go over this very exciting session that we had on Friday. Thanks, Valdilea. Uh, my slides will be screened. I think you should just say with next slide, yeah, and they will do it. Okay. Thanks, Valdilea. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening. It's my pleasure to report uh, to you from the therapeutic session of the Blue PGR COVID-19 Research Synergies Meeting. The therapeutic session was a very dense session with speakers from a variety of developing and, and, and developed countries that provided a diverse and concrete overview of the COVID-19 related therapeutic research activities from around the globe. Next slide, please. No, can you uh, go, uh, go back? Come. Yes. Starting with the therapeutic compound research, the, uh, it was uh, highlighted the importance of innovative methods, example, of computer aided drug design uh, could be used when no other promising strategy out of wet lab can run simulations before in vitro, in vitro, and in vivo analysis. Also, it was uh, identified the added value of repurposing of drugs. Efficient use of time and resource facilitates moving into phase one, use partnerships with industry. It's possible that a combination of drugs will be necessary to adequately treat COVID-19. Therefore, we need evidence on efficacy, efficacy added value of combination treatment. Also, in order to have a combination uh, treatment, we need research on interactions, treatment, treatment, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, treatment stage of illness, treatment setting, comorbidity, co-infections. It was also uh, identified the need for a, a good connection between Preclinical evidence in clinical trials. Risk to, to take, it is risky to take compounds with weak preclinical evidence base into clinical trials. Sometimes the drugs look good in in vitro studies, but when you go to uh, the uh, clinical uh, trial, we will see that uh, it will not uh, it will not work. Sometimes the drug, the level of uh, uh, the drug that we can achieve with the uh, usage drug for treatment that is registered, it's not enough for COVID-19. Next slide, please. On clinical trials, it was identified that a better coordination for large scale trials is needed, avoiding multitude of small scale studies that are underpowered, inaccurate controlled, and not powered to look at small yet important differences. We need 
global, more globalization over nationalization, collaboration over competition. We can identify that even in countries, there is a, a lot of competition. The, uh, it was the added value of adaptive trials methodology in the context of the COVID pandemic is very clear. To allow to study multiple questions and compounds, to allow stratification on various levels, to reach endpoints more efficiently, standardization and sharing of data. Need more we need more standardization of trials endpoints, for instance, to allow for comparison and pooling of data between studies and regions. It was highlighted the need of institutional support regarding patents, intellectual property, data sharing, biobank, among others. It's important to have in place a strong translation pipeline and public-private partnership culture. Trust is key. Environment of reciprocity between data providers and data analysts to man maintain lines of communication and engagement. We had a, a, a speaker on community engagement and it was highlighted that public must be empowered to get involved in, this, in all levels of decision making. And a good community engagement requires also communication and transparency. Next slide. The context is very, is very important. It was identified that the existing clinical trials capacity in low and middle income countries should be better explored for the large trials. It is also crucial to consider geographic difference in the COVID pandemic. Consider experience in low, in, in low and middle income countries to run trials, regulatory capacity, lab capacity, among others. Low and middle income uh, countries have high interest to participate in COVID-19 research efforts. It is important to have the population of these countries represented and also to increase the capacity on clinical trials in the context of pandemics. But it's also important to take into account differences regarding standard of care, feasibility of endpoints, healthcare infrastructure conditions, staff training, comorbidities, co-infection, such as tuberculosis and HIV in high burden countries. One important topic was on data sharing. Data sharing policy should be inclusive to researchers from low and middle income country, countries to provide ownership and autonomy to increase opportunities for low and middle income countries, researchers to publish, get recognition, get funding. To increase opportunity for use of data obtained from studies conducted in low and middle income countries could be linked to commitment of collaboration with capacity building of researchers. A, a more global coordination is, uh, is important but also for prospective collaboration across national boards. Standards of clinical research, ethics, standardization of trials, data sharing, role of funders. funders. Use existing networks and infrastructure to get things moving rapidly. Strengthen lab capacities, overcome bureaucracy hurdles for trial implementation. Establish sustainable data sharing platforms. There is a need to anticipate new viral epi pandemic. Research for development of pan antivirals, pan genomes, pan family or multifamily into phase one clinical trials. Drug screening on continuous basis to identify drugs and drug targets for non, non viruses. Thank you for your attention.
Thanks uh, a lot, uh, uh, Vandilea, for, for your very nice presentation on this very important topic. And I'm sure we have a few minutes for discussion at the end of the four sessions summary, and we'll come back to that. Charu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yasdin. So it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce the co-chairs of our uh, session on uh, uh, on transmission, uh, the preparing for second wave stopping transmission co-chairs were Dr. Marion Koopmans and Dr. David Trisman. Uh, Dr. Koopmans, as many of you know, is the head of uh, Department of Virus Sciences at the Erasmus University Rotterdam in the uh, Netherlands. Her research focuses on unraveling the modes of transmission of viruses among animals uh, and between animals and humans and the use of pathogenic genomic information to unravel these pathways and to signal changes in transmission uh, or disease impact. Uh, Dr. Fisman is a professor in the Division of Epidemiology at the Dalai Lana School of Public Health and Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation uh, at the University of Toronto and a practicing internist with a focus on infectious diseases. Uh, so welcome, Marion and uh, David. Uh, the transmission session was exceptionally uh, um, alive with the discussions, and I noted that on YouTube, it's already received about 700 views. So uh, we look forward to seeing a summary of uh, what came out of that session. Yes, thank you. Um, can I have the next slide? So what uh, this session tried to do is focus on what are really the hot topics, so the key challenges, um, by first uh, uh, looking at where do we all agree that this is currently uh, accepted knowledge about the, vi the virus and the host interaction, and next uh, slide and also about the uh, epidemiology and ecology. So these were some of the things that are not uh, hotly debated, controversial, etc. So next. But what we then uh, did uh, focus a lot of the presentations and discussion on is some key unresolved or partially resolved issues. And the, this is the, the, the list. First of all, what happened at the start of the pandemic? Uh, is this forward transmission of SARS-CoV that we're seeing to animals, is that a problem? Uh, what is the relative contribution of droplet aerosol contact transmission in different settings with different uh, uh, system setups uh, and what have you? What is the contribution of asymptomatic transmission and how can we recognize, can we recognize uh, with the tapering out of the viruses if and when um, new properties arise that we need to look into. So next. And uh, one of the uh, uh, interesting uh, publications that are in preprint out there has done an, an inventory of the literature and really mapped out quite nicely the complex elements that need to be taken into account from droplet size uh, to virus behavior within droplets, virus stability within droplets, the relation of the droplet formation to different types of activities that people do, um, the relationship between the kinetics of infection in individuals, uh, and then that all of that then translates into some type of uh, exposure uh, risk. Uh, which then is received differently at the receiving end as well. So quite the complexity there. Next. So these are some animated slides, so you will need to click through them a little bit. But uh, the, so this is the starting picture and the uh, one first critical need uh, expressed is the need for very well designed multidisciplinary outbreak research to address some of these key knowledge gaps uh, for transmission. So there's categories of them. And the first one, you can click, is a series of questions around the uh, uh, infection biology and immunity side. So uh, uh, what do the kinetics look like in different individuals with different health 
uh, status uh, and in relation to developing immune response or pre-existing immunity. And the next series of questions is around, uh, is, is more the traditional epidemiological or public health investigation side is what uh, uh, do we need to know regarding the contribution of the different potential uh, routes of infection, uh, modes of transmission, um, uh, and how do we assess that? The third series of questions is around the uh, somewhat hidden uh, uh, situation that we do see um, uh, animals getting infected uh, with a potential risk, if that is not really uh, monitored carefully, of evolution of a new reservoir um, out there. And the fourth is a series of questions around the viruses, their stability, and the role of virus evolution in relation to each of these different uh, categories of questions. And next. And then this, the second uh, need is uh, to do similar multidisciplinary intervention studies, because there's a lot of work looking at individual parameters, but very little that actually weighs the different potential uh, 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 factors that are involved in transmission. So here again, first uh, is studies that look at what influences whether uh, a, a person with SARS-CoV becomes a transmitter, um, including uh, links to the treatment uh, work, treatment uh, uh, development. Second category is questions uh, looking at intervention uh, of transmission at the receiving end in individuals, but also what does it take to, uh, for instance, behaviorally to, to uh, contain uh, the virus there. And that also brings in the issues with uh, the role of vaccination, different types of uh, eff efficacy in different categories of people uh, with different levels of immunosuppression. There's the potential for enhancing innate immunity with the BCG trials, for instance, and uh, plasma prevention and beha behavioral in interventions. The third category uh, then uh, makes it, that was a very clear straight uh, and strong, loud uh, statement from the discussions in this uh, session, do bring in the architectural science, the environmental engineering, the aerobiologists, uh, because there's a lot of knowledge out there that is not currently uh, really integrated into the studies. And then finally, uh, there's intervention studies uh, and also early warning studies that could be developed at the animal side that are seen as, that were, were considered to be very important to try and understand how, if there is animal spillover, what are best ways to contain, um, but also uh, to, to look at the early steps of this uh, pandemic um, and address the question whether or not there may still be a hidden uh, reservoir and how to go for very targeted uh, hotspot surveillance strategies. Next. So there, uh, throughout the session and, and several of the other sessions, of course, there was this, uh, this clear message, we need to uh, widen the type of collaborations that we've been having. And this is a, a paper that was actually initiated by uh, Jeremy that uh, was, was uh, written, uh, published in November. And it's amazing how, uh, how important this is, is in this pandemic, the need to really bring many different types of disciplines uh, together to, to try and tackle the key questions, take them forward uh, jointly. Next. So then, the, so we discussed these, these needs for providing deeper evidence base, then the need for intervention studies based on that uh, knowledge about uh, uh, transmission, and the third category then 
focused on uh, the need for research to then understand how do you get the messages across because it's one thing to know what to do but it's it's a very different thing as we all know to actually influence people's uh, behavior and also to get the information across so here there was a very interesting uh, discussion and session on what what i call the twitter brain here produced from uh, looking at patterns in uh, Twitter messages um, and also looking that, uh, at the fact that these communities developed uh, over the course since January that become increasingly segregated uh, around certain theories or uh, beliefs um, and that are very different to uh, influence if uh, so with public health communication. Uh, and uh, it, it will be a critical component to, in trying to uh, get a grasp on the evolution of this pandemic um, was the conclusion there. Next. Um, clear uh, from the discussion, um, and I think also mentioned just uh, before, is that one size may not fit all because it is the, based on the same evidence base, but also some lack thereof. Um, regions may need to make different uh, choices and that may also in part be uh, culturally uh, different and it is important to uh, understand where that matters where that may impact on the evolution and where it does it really doesn't and how we explain that because there's a lot of confusion in the general public about this next um, well I've labeled this standing on each other's uh, shoulders, the critical need for data harmonization, governance and sharing. And uh, personally, I think it's a little bit worrisome just from the overview to see that there are seemingly competing data sharing initiatives uh, that are being funded. And I think that's something that, that clearly needs to be, lo be looked at. Uh, the need for, uh, data, terminology, technology standards across the board, um, and uh, also particularly for cross or international uh, studies, because what we've been seeing, of course, is a bit of retraction into national uh, programs and research. Next and last. And uh, in addition, that it's important to remember that the translational work and the really fast evolving science that can be done now has been possible because there was a, found, a sound foundation in ba more basic science and that we should not forget to keep inv investing in that as well while we're busy to try and, and, and uh, control this uh, pandemic. So that's my final slide summary. Thank you, Marianne. As usual, very uh, thoughtful and well put together. Uh, so hopefully I see that uh, as usual, uh, the issues around transmission are always generating questions. So we'll handle some at the end of the session. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Yazdan will introduce the social sciences chair. Thanks, Cheru. So Marion started actually to introduce social sciences, I think. Uh, so uh, we have a, a great social science session um, on, on, on Tuesday, and uh, uh, the two uh, co-chairs were Dr. Kenneth Camargo from the Rio de Janeiro State University and, and uh, Christy Cruz from Eprise, Charles Darwin University in Australia. Dr. Kenneth uh, uh, de Camargo uh, is a full-time uh, tenured professor at the Instituto de Medicina Social uh, at the Universidad de Estado de Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Kenneth's research focuses on the production, diffusion, and use of biomedical knowledge, applying the theoretical and methodological Jews of science studies. He has works as a physician at the university's hospital, served a consultant for the Brazilian Ministry of Health, the vice president of Brazilian Public Health Association, and honorary vice president for Latin America and the Caribbean American Public Health Association. Uh, Christy Crook 
is a proud of original woman of the Uhaliai nation and has a spiritual connection to the Wiradjuri people. She is currently an op original program manager with the Health Protection Unit for Hunter New England Population Health. Christie's research focuses on developing a process of how to privilege Aboriginal voices in infectious disease emergency planning and response. Christie's formal qualification, lived experience and working career has provided her with in-depth knowledge and understanding uh, uh, of the health and health related issues that of original people face. Uh, so thanks for a nine to 10, ten minute summary, Christy and Kenneth, on your session. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, Yasdin. Uh, Yama, hello. Um, before I would start, um, I'd like to thank the team and acknowledge the work that went into organising the social science session and recognise Jao, Morgan, the chairs of the breakout rooms, the rapporteurs, and the rest of the team for a wonderful session. So our social science section, uh, we explored four topics in which invited speakers presented their research and as a way to foster discussion among participants. The four topics that pre um, were presented in the breakout rooms included population experience, communications and engagement, governance and methodologies. So today, Kenneth and I will report on the highlights from each of those topics and share with you the overall key points. Next slide. So the key highlights from the population experience session was that COVID um, has highlighted the inequities among population groups, particularly those groups that are already at risk. Uh, public health measures such as social distancing has created many social and economic problems and has disrupted research itself. Um, Socioeconomic inequalities and challenges have meant that compliance with public health measures was unevenly distributed and that the pandemic is serving as an excuse for abusing control and enhanced surveillance of the population. And systemic and structural barriers that have further marginalised and discriminated against vulnerable populations such as refugees, incarcerated people and Indigenous peoples. There's a need to further understand the health impact of the pandemic on societal issues, such as possible increase in mortality because of uh, other causes such as results of healthcare system overload. And also that uh, social protection seems to be missing in all of this. And there is a need for finding sustainable ways to access communities through respectful and meaningful community engagement so they can have autonomy over their health. Next slide. So the highlights from the communications and engagements group identified that there's lots of misinformation about the aspects of the pandemic, which in turn creates fear and distrust in government authorities, which is hampering the necessary and appropriate responses. Uh, the group also discussed and highlighted that contextual is acceptable and appropriate communication strategies with diverse population groups can only happen if messages are co-designed in respectful engagement with target communities. And lastly, co-producing knowledge with communities is essential to direct communication strategies that make sense and valuable to target population groups. Kenneth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the third theme was governance and the, the, the team about uh, the session was uh, started with a proposition of this definition of what governance is about rules and processes uh, to organize societies, relationships between uh, several actors and about decisions. Uh, it's implicit here that it deals with issues of power and legitimacy, both from the political point of view and also from a technical point of view. And uh, the whole issue about who is included and who is left out in discussions about uh, both research and, and uh, public policy. We, uh, there were several reports with problems with, with policy making, um, both from having a, a, a top-down approach that did not include uh, community participation and thus compromise the res possible results of such policies, and also from not taking serious expert advice. And another problem was the, the, the fact that we have all these uh, watertight compartments, both in terms of research policy making, policy implementation, that make it very difficult to coordinate the response. 
And this is not an issue only for uh, low and middle income countries everywhere. This has been detected even in the richer countries. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of methodologies, it was a very rich discussion uh, and was heavily emphasized that we have, we must have mixed method approaches uh, to research uh, that drop the, the strengths of uh, qualitative and quantitative approaches to explore and uncover a series of perspectives and relationships and not just describing the problem. Uh, one point that was made all the time is that even if you have, for instance, a vaccine, and, but people don't trust the vaccine, they are not going to, uh, there's not going to be an uptake of it. So this has to be uh, discussed and, and also uh, studied, uh, thus leading to the importance of having inter and transdisciplinary approaches. Uh, th there is a challenge to integrate multiple sources and, ty and types of data. Uh, all the research is generating a lot of data. Uh, there, is, there are issues of sharing also how to analyze the, this uh, huge amount of uh, stuff that's coming out. And uh, on, on the field, we've uh, had reports of the difficulties of integrating different time frames. Uh, there are, when we are working with certain types of uh, methodologies from the social sciences, they do not provide short-term answers. Uh, we need more time to engage with communities and have answers back. And they will not provide uh, responses in the short term. And a final issue that was from pointed out is that a lot of the field work uh, in the social sciences involved direct contact with communities. And with the pandemic, uh, all the, the lockdown and, and, and quarantine procedures, uh, some um, field work has to be halted. And this, this has led to the need to renegotiate schedules and perhaps even hold projects within the time frame that was allotted. It might not be possible to conduct the research that was originally designed. Uh, back to you, Chrissy. Next slide. Thanks, Kenneth. Um, just to summarise the overall key points from the four topics. Uh, the poor health status of vulnerable populations is fundamentally a social construct um, which requires social sciences methods to be understood and to devise adequate responses that recognise and address the interrelationship of social determinants of health. A key point across all of the theme was to consider difficulties in accessing and engaging certain uh, key populations with high vulnerabilities and the importance of addressing demands from other overlooked groups, such as the caregivers in the communities. Uh, working and engaging with communities in making decisions to co-design, co guide and implement public health strategies that make sense for communities that are achievable and build and support and empower communities was really important um, in all of the discussions. There was lots of discussion about uh, the research or to combine mixed methodologies and there was perceived hierarchies between qualitative and quantitative methods and the type of data must be dispelled. There was also lots of discussion around the need to provide adequate funding for sustainable projects over a long period of time. Thanks, Kenneth. Thank you, Christy. Next slide, please. Uh, one thing that was highlighted, and this has been present in the previous panels as well from the other sessions, is that we need to have a better articulation among different parties in order to avoid duplication and waste of resources. This has been detected with a lot of research that's ongoing. Um, an, an issue that was uh, very, very much discussed and asked for is to have more collaboration and interactions with other researchers, funders, and also, also health authorities. And one thing that was really stressed was uh, in terms of the kind of thing that funders can help with, uh, aside from direct funding of research projects, is to find ways to build an infrastructure for easy interaction between all these actors, particularly among researchers themselves. Uh, another point that was made is that the whole cycle of research, starting with the moment that we identify priorities and going all the way down to doing the actual research and disseminating results has to be interdisciplinary, has to include the participation of social scientists and have to include inputs from affected communities. And finally, uh, we highlighted the importance of the critical approaches that discuss uh, ethical issues and power relationships, uh, not only in the field between researchers and populations that are being researched, but among all the actors involved. And uh, in particular, there was a very strong recommendation to make room for voices from the global south and to look into uh, real, actual peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. Uh, we would like once again to thank everyone that participated. This was a very rich 
discussion and was very complicated to try to summarize. This is just a, a, a very, uh, some glimpses of the very rich discussion that we had and that will be uh, available as well as a recording. Thanks everyone. Uh, I yield back to the uh, coordinator. Thanks, Eric, uh, Kenneth. Thanks, Chrissy. No, it was a great uh, summary of the session. Thanks again. Charu? Yeah, thanks, Yasdin. So, uh, so that's great. Excellent summaries. And uh, we do have some time, which we put in for a few questions. Some of the questions are coming in, and the, uh, some of the co-chairs are answer answering that. Uh, I just uh, saw that uh, a few minutes ago, Melanie Seville has uh, joined us. So welcome, uh, Melanie. As many of you know, and I summarized earlier, uh, Melanie is actually looking after the vaccine portfolio, uh, development portfolio for CEPI. Uh, so uh, Melanie, uh, can I invite you to, because you're very much in the thick of uh, vaccine development and negotiations for equitable access and everything. So maybe at this point, I can ask you for, uh, your thoughts on where we are with the vaccines and, you know, what are you seeing in the horizon here? Certainly, and thank you, Chair, for, um, uh, for that, that introduction. Very happy to say, indeed, a few words of where things are with vaccines. And I think we can all see that there's been actually remarkable progress in terms of, of vaccine development. Um, when you look at the landscape of vaccines uh, specifically, over, there are over 200 vaccines in development. Um, and I think every day now, the number of candidates that are getting into clinical trials is um, rising. I, I think we were counting 23. I, I didn't look today, so there are probably more than that already in, in clinical trials. And, and some of those are even advancing into um, efficacy trials right now. So really a, a, a tremendous amount of work and effort with vaccine developers, um, basic scientists and the large um, vaccine manufacturers to move um, moving forward. Um, I, I think it, it has to be at such a, a large scale when you really think about perhaps, um, you know, what the challenge is. So just as an example, working with CEPI and under what we call the COVAX pillar that I hope everyone has, has heard about, um, we are aiming for a global fair allocation system to have 2 billion doses of vaccine delivered before the end of 2021. Um, obviously, um, with the portfolio of vaccines that is being currently supported under the COVAX pillar, but with others as well. Um, so we do invite others um, to join and we're also looking at expanding um, our portfolio. In terms of the progress of vaccines, perhaps maybe just a word on clinical trials. We are beginning to see clinical trial results of the phase uh, one uh, trials. Some of the candidates coming out of, um, of China, um, some of the first um, mRNA data coming out um, and also viral vectors with, with data being, being, being presented and, and in general, being encouraging, even though this is early data in terms of safety profile and vaccines generating an immune response. Um, but I think we all have to recognize it's still early days and the importance of demonstrating the efficacy of the vaccines uh, and also looking at very large scale manufacturing to meet what, what will be um, a global demand. So maybe that's just a few few general words here. Um, you know, obviously, op open to answering any questions as well. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, don't uh, log off yet, uh, Melanie, because we do have some questions. And I think uh, Yazdin is going to talk a little bit about all the questions that are coming on regarding endpoint uh, harmonization. Yeah, thanks, Charu. Um, to, and I think that Glenda, if I understood well, is also on. Uh, so thanks, Glenda, for joining. She is with, uh, with Jeffrey. So one question that I, I actually does that many people ask, and it is both for the vaccine trials and, uh, and for uh, treatment trials is efforts that has been done uh, to actually try to harmonize clinical trial endpoints. Of course, we have more, uh, 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 more experience with now treatments because we have had a couple of treatments, but maybe uh, I, I will ask first the question maybe to Melanie actually uh, and, to, uh, um, and to Deborah 
regarding vaccine trials on, on the efforts that, that's, that have been done. And then uh, maybe the same question actually to, to, to treatment group, but I don't know, Melanie and Deborah, if you want to comment on that. Um, sure, maybe, maybe I can start and um, invite um, Deb to, 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 to add. I, I think it's fair to say there have been a number of initiatives um, to really look at uh, endpoints. I mean, to highlight um, the, the working group with WHO on the Solidarity 3 trial, really looking at um, what would be a, a very large um, uh, efficacy trial with endpoints that um, could um, include multiple candidates in the same trial using um, 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 uh, shared control groups. There's been um, also work done um, by uh, um, Active and Operation Warp Speed again, looking at, at endpoints, but and and also um, you know within CEPI, we're always looking at guiding towards ensuring that there are as much harmonisation in endpoints as possible. And I would like to emphasise also the importance not just for efficacy but also for safety um, to harmonise uh, case case definitions. Um, uh, and, and, and try and be as harmonized as possible in terms of uh, endpoints for safety. I, I do think it's important that we have the opportunity to compare apples with apples and obviously that sort of harmonization um, will really help. Um, in relation to that, and, and Deb can speak more to this as, as the real regulatory expert, uh, the FDA have now um, drawn up a guideline in terms of um, a, a vaccine development where where indeed there is quite a lot of guidance um, in terms of um, potential endpoints that, that, that could result in, in harmonization. But uh, may, maybe over to, to Deb to add. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, yeah, so I was just going to mention the, the FDA guidance. And then um, again, in, in the context of, of COVAX, uh, you know, uh, for those uh, that, that didn't know that, you know, we have a regulatory advisory group um, standing up that group within COVAX uh, to talk about, you know, again, product agnostic issues, but, you know, definitely endpoints uh, could, could, will continue to be um, a, a topic that we can, um, we can discuss. And I think that, you know, again, the harmonization across uh, for, uh, you know, uh, the regulatory harmonization that I spoke about earlier um, is definitely something that um, is, is a topic and, and these endpoint discussions uh, will continue. Thank you. One thing regarding the treatment that has worked quite well was within Solidarity, some daughter studies that were collecting more detail, but they had the same outcomes that were shared with Solidarity. So not only you have harmonization, but also from some pieces, more data on safety, for example, to be able to detect that earlier and think that was good. So I don't know, Glenda, you want to start for the treatment harmonization of endpoints? I don't know if Glenda, you hear us. I am. So, I mean, yes. I think both for vaccines and for treatment, um, irrespective of whether the trials are, um, you know, or together or are separate, um, one should harmonize so that you can have, um, you, you, can, you can compare cost studies. So for vaccines, it's, it's pretty easy, um, I think. Um, it's, it's easy to harmonize for vaccines. You can collect your immunogenicity on the same days, you can agree on binding antibodies and, 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 and neutralizing antibodies, and you can agree on what your entry criteria is and, um, and your, um, your, your, your endpoints. So it seems quite easy to do it for, for vaccines. For, for treatment, um, mm -hmm. I, think, I, think it, it, um, you'd, I think the more you harmonize, the more, more comparable you can be across uh, studies. And I guess you just have to agree on your endpoints and what you what you consider mild, moderate, and severe disease, and um, what you consider um, to be, uh, you know, to you know what your composite endpoint is, and what you consider to be um, efficacious um, days, you know, days of less shedding or days um, out of hospital. So I think it, I think it's important to get um, uh, comparability so that 
it is easy to try and compare. I mean, obviously, it's, it's sometimes hard to compare, particularly for, um, you know, for, for, for low middle income countries, you know, we obviously um, uh, only we um, admit much later, you know, we put people on oxygen much later, uh, we use high flow nasal oxygen, um, instead of ventilation. Um, and so some of the therapeutic interventions, um, for standard, of prevent, standard of care may be different, which may make um, comparisons difficult. But um, so I think standard of, standard of care in a low middle income country setting um, will, can affect your outcome because um, we may not all have access to the same care and, um, and we may use different criteria to move people from to hospitalization to uh, high care to ICU. Um, and so I think it's important then to make sure that um, we try and harmonize standard of care, um, but sometimes that becomes hard because if we, um, we have problems with access to say half loan, say now you, you run out of oxygen, like in South Africa, we have an oxygen shortage. And um, if you're on a study and your standard of prevention is so different, sometimes it becomes hard to um, be comparable, but one should try and at least have a minimum standard of care that can be um, implemented across studies so that you can get some comparability um, um, across studies by treatment arm. So I think uh, vaccines are easy, uh, but treatment seems to me a little bit more, a bit harder uh, to try and harmonize, um, particularly given the background standard of care may be different. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Linda. Do you want Valdilea to comment on that point too? Yes, I do. Uh, one point that I, I would like to highlight is that uh, it's not enough to discuss uh, uh, among researchers involved in uh, large uh, initiatives uh, like Solidarity, Recovery and Actives. But uh, we need a, a more inclusive discussion uh, with a broader uh, uh, participation of researchers in low and middle income country, uh, because otherwise we, we will continue to have our national trials and we may use uh, different enterprises. And so I think that we need to, to have a broader approach uh, regarding the harmonization of uh, enterprises. Thanks, and I think Marion says that we should also have uh, endpoints harmonized for transmission, and of course, Marion. Charu, a question on social science. Yep, so uh, just uh, turning to the social sciences co-chairs, uh, there's a few questions that are coming in. One of them is about the implications of long-term physical distancing for community living, older adults. You know, we hear this a lot in Canada that uh, the uh, harshness of uh, keeping the uh, older folks in the long-term care uh, completely isolated from their families has, has devastating effects. So uh, thoughts about that from uh, Christy and uh, uh, Kenneth. Uh, but, uh, the, we have two, two kinds of problems with regards to that. One is what you already pointed out is the kind of effect that this is having in terms of long-term. And the other problem that we have is that lots of people cannot do any kind of social distancing. Uh, people who live in substandard housing conditions or who have uh, sort of uh, th this kind of uh, uh, gig economy jobs that they don't have any job security, they haven't have been able to do any kind of uh, social distancing measures. Uh, there have been initiatives to try and bring, uh, reduce at least the, the, the demands for distancing that have been present, like uh, implementing uh, barriers uh, within those housing uh, uh, um, facilities so that the, the families can have at least some sort of interaction with the elderly. But uh, it, uh, it, we, we do need to have research specific on that. This, the, most of the things that we have right now are uh, reports from the ground, but not systematic research as far as I know. I don't know if Chrissy would like to complement. I was just going to comment, Kenneth, from a First Nations perspective where, um, you know, lots of our 
our families are, are quite large and lots of extended families living together in small, inadequate, insufficient housing um, is causing um, some concern for families not being able to isolate safely. So it's providing extra wraparound support and care and, and um, ensuring that families are, are engaged in making decisions together to explore uh, supported accommodation options um, to, for families um, who, who need to isolate safely. But there, there needs to be lots of research around that and, and people's experiences of, of isolation and quarantine. Thank you. So uh, I think there's lots of interesting questions, but we will have time to take more audience questions as we move along. I'm just I'm just conscious of the time uh, and the panelists who have uh, you know taken time from their very busy agenda to be with us today. So I'd like to thank all the co-chairs for excellent summaries and some really excellent questions. Uh, we will have time to take on more audience questions. We've embedded that time between different rounds of questions that we'll do with the panelists. Uh, so with that, uh, we, let's move on now to the panel discussions. Uh, and I would like to welcome all our panelists. We have an outstanding uh, array of uh, panelists who are leaders in this area of leading the response across the world in different areas uh, uh, for COVID-19. Uh, and I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, Yazdin to introduce the first few of the speakers, and then I'll introduce the next speakers and then we move on to a uh, question and answer. So Yazdin, over to you. Thanks a lot Ch Charu and as Charu said we have an, an, an outstanding uh, number of uh, uh, panelists today that I wanted to, to thank all because uh, we know that how busy they, they are especially at this time. So first uh, Marco Cavalleri from the European Medicine Agency and it is a pleasure and honor for me to introduce Marco who is the head of anti-infective and vaccines at the European Medicine Agency. He has previously served as the AMA as a scientific administrator in the scientific advice and orphan drug sector, especially being in charge of anti-infective uh, 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 and vaccines, uh, scientific advice procedure. Marco is a pharmacologist, who spent several years in industry in research and development, mainly in the area of anti-infectives, uh, covering different positions in preclinical and clinical uh, uh, development. Thanks a lot, Marco, again. And our second panelist is say, Jeremy Farrar, that everyone knows, and it's again a great pleasure for me to introduce Jeremy, who is a clinician scientist and director of Welcome Trust, Prior to joining Wellcome Trust, Jeremy was director of the Oxford University Clinical Research Unit in Vietnam, where he re his research interests were in infectious diseases and global health, with a focus on emerging infectious. He was named uh, uh, 12th in the Fortune list of the 50 world's greatest leaders in 2015, and was awarded the Memorial Medal at the Ho Chi Minh City Medal from the government of Vietnam. In 2018, he was awarded the President Jimmy and Rosalind Carter Humanitarian of the Year Award. He is a fellow of the Academy of Medical Science UK, the uh, National Academy USA, the European Molecular Biology Organization, and a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, Jeremy was knighted in the Queen's 2018 New Year Honours for services to global health. And thanks again, Jeremy, for being there. It's also a great, great pleasure to introduce Nina Gobat from the University of Oxford. Uh, Dr. Nina Gobat is a senior researcher at the University of Oxford, whose recent research focuses on clinical and potential social science research for academic response. Nina has worked on uh, operational uh, aspects of research preparedness and response for the EU-wide PREPARE consortium, including their COVID-19 response. She leads a cross-cutting social science work stream in RECOVER, the EU-wide clinical research consortium 
that represents the prepares COVID-19 response. In addition to the outbreak response service development for the European Clinical Research Alliance for Infectious Disease Project. She is also the focal point for the newly formed global outbreak alert and response network social science research group and chairs the WHO COVID-19 research roadmap social science working group. Thanks, Nina. Um, we have also the great pleasure to have uh, Richard Achet from the CEPI. Uh, Dr. Richard Achet is the chief executive officer of the Coalition for the Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. Richard was previously the acting directly, director of the U.S. Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, BARDA, and served as Director of Medical Preparedness Policy on the Homeland National Security Council under Presidents Bush and Obama, respectively. He received his medical degree from Vanderbilt and completed clinical training in internal medicine and medical oncology at Cornell and at Duke. Charu, thanks, and thanks a lot again, Richard. Thanks, Yastin. So yeah, quite the elite uh, uh, panel we have here. So I'll give uh, Yastin a chance to catch his breath <laughs> and introduce the rest of the speakers. So we have uh, Marion Koopmans. Uh, so we've invited Marion to join the panel because she, in her capacity as the Glopidar Scientific Advisor. Uh, and as you heard before, Marion is the head of uh, Department of Aero Sciences at Erasmus University. Uh, and her research focuses primarily on the modes of transmission of viruses between among animals and animals to humans uh, and pathogenic genomic information to ravel those uh, pathways and to signal uh, changes in transmission or disease impact. Uh, so welcome, Marion. Uh, thanks for uh, doing the long haul through the whole three hours today. Uh, and then the next uh, panelist that I'd like to uh, introduce to you is uh, Dr. Michael Makanga. Uh, who is the Executive Director of the European and Developing Countries uh, Clinical Trials Partnership, EDCTP. Uh, he's a clinician scientist working on health and poverty-related infectious diseases in Africa, uh, including in medical product development and clinical regulatory activities. Uh, he's a medical doctor from Makarkare uh, University, Uganda, uh, has a master's degree from Liverpool, University of Liverpool, uh, and a PhD in clinical pharmacology at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in UK. He's also a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians uh, of Edinburgh, Scotland, and he serves and has served in a variety of different scientific and policy advisory boards for international products. Uh, and then my uh, distinct pleasure to welcome with us Dr. Sumya Swaminathan. Very privileged to have you here, uh, Sumya, from WHO. Many of you know and see Sumia so, uh, in, as her, in her role as the chief scientist of the WHO. Uh, prior to this position, she has served as WHO's deputy director general for programs, secretary to the government of India for health research and director general for the Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR, uh, and coordinator of UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, WHO special program for research and training in tropical diseases in Geneva, uh, she is an elected fellow, a uh, foreign fellow of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine, a fellow for all three sciences academy in India, and she has been on several and uh, continues to lead the WHO response uh, to the COVID-19. Uh, many of us also know uh, Dr. Swaminathan from her leadership and as a TB researcher. So welcome, Sumya. Thanks so much for taking time from your very busy schedule. We appreciate it. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to introduce our two uh, Glopidar co-chairs, uh, Dr. Barbara Kernstein, uh, who is the head of the unit of the unit responsible for combating diseases uh, in the People Directorate of the Director, uh, Directorate General for Research and Innovation in the European Commission. Uh, Barbara has worked in international public health with the Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, John Hopkins Bloomberg uh, School of Public Health, uh, and DG Development and Cooperation of the European Commission. Uh, she's an MD from the Catholic Universitat uh, Leuven, uh, a postgraduate certificate from tropical medicine from the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, 
uh, and a Master of Public Health from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of uh, uh, Public Health. Uh, and finally, last but definitely not the least, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Mfafale uh, from the South African MRC, who is also a co uh, Lopidar co-chair along with uh, Yazdin, Barbara, and myself. Uh, and uh, uh, Jeffrey is the vice president of the research at the South African Medical Research Council, the South African MRC. He's an elected member of the Academy of Sciences of South African and National Research uh, Foundation C1 rated researcher. Jeffrey is also affiliated to the Sifako Magato uh, Health Sciences University, where he has served as the co-director of the uh, South African MRC Diarrheal Pathogen Research Unit and the head of South African Vaccination and Immunization Center. Uh, uh, Jeffrey has served on a number of boards, has led a number of uh, national and international responses, uh, and his personal research includes uh, epidemiology and genomics of infectious diseases, vaccination control of infectious diseases, and strengthening immunization services and policies. So a very warm welcome to all the panelists. I think at this point we're going to switch off the uh, slide. Uh, and bring uh, live all the panelists uh, in on the screen. Uh, so welcome everybody. I would ask all the panelists to turn on their uh, speaker or their uh, videos. And as we go through the, the questions, we can uh, turn on the uh, speakers as well. Um, great, so I'm looking at the uh, agenda and I think I'm supposed to uh, kick off the panel discussion questions. So the way we're going to do this is uh, just to remind the panelists uh, and uh, also for the audience that uh, 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 Yasdin and I are going to ask some introdu introductory questions uh, and ask the speakers to speak from their perspective on these general opening questions. Uh, then we'll have a round of specific questions that are directed towards speakers. Uh, and then we'll take some audience questions before we see if there's time to ask more directed questions or we'll wrap up the uh, panel discussions. Uh, I'll ask the panel uh, panelists uh, recognizing that we want to, it's a large panel and we want to give everybody a chance uh, to keep to the point and try, you know, to speak, give their answers between three to five minutes. Uh, so Jeremy, I guess I'm going to start off uh, first with you. Um, so speaking from your, you know, you've been in the middle of a lot of global initiatives and uh, discussions. Uh, in the last six months, as the pandemic has swept through the world, what are some of the successes where the global research community has done well? And what are some of the biggest challenges uh, we are facing and continue to face in terms of uh, research? Thanks, Jeru, and, uh, and thanks uh, to you and to to Yazdan and, and everybody else that's been so involved in, in bringing this um, meeting together. Thank, thank you very much indeed and for all you're doing with Glopidar in uh, extraordinary circumstances. Um, six months in, I, I, I think it's, it is very important to reflect on some successes um, and also to see this as a really important critical moment in this pandemic. Um, uh, over the coming months, there will be people wanting to get back to their normal lives. Uh, scientists will be wanting to get back to their other work. They've, uh, many people have been dragged into COVID research over the last few months. That, in the end, is not sustainable, and we'll have to get back uh, to, to other things that critically need doing. And I think it's really important in our, all of our communications to get across that we're only very much at the start of this pandemic. Um, lockdowns in my view, have been very successful in reducing transmission and new infections, but they haven't changed any of the fundamentals of this infection. The virus, biology, its transmission, how infectious it is, the clinical syndrome it causes, uh, the inequalities it drives through the world, and of course the tertiary consequences in economics and indeed geopolitics. So I think we are only very much at the start and, uh, and we need to be humble about that. Um, we don't yet have a clear exit strategy and, uh, and we need to define one because, as I say, the lockdowns won't do that for us. The success is I think there's been enormous commitment and energy from everybody. Um, uh, I think it's dragged a whole generation of people into infectious diseases and global health. It's made 
the public aware of science and the role it can play, both, both the positive, but also we must be aware of this, some of the negative consequences. As Marion said earlier, it has shown the importance of long-term investments in basic science. Um, whichever, social sciences, biomedical sciences, clinical science, whichever bit of science, uh, it's, it's been true, I think, that those places that have had the strongest investments have been able to respond the quickest. Uh, I would pay tribute to some of the clinical trials. I'll pick that out as, as one of, I think, I think, the successes to date, particularly, I think, the solidarity trial and the recovery trial. I re do regret they weren't able to be won, but in the end, it's been okay. There's been uh, evidence generated from those, uh, and I think that's been a success. I, I, uh, I think we could have done more there. Preprint and open access, I think, has had its challenges. Yes, there's been mistakes, undoubtedly, as people worked at speed, but nevertheless, some successes. I would pay tribute here to uh, the WHO. They're under enormous strain. Uh, the people running these programs at WHO have been working flat out through Ebola over the last few years, and yet uh, their communication strategies, I think, have been spot on throughout this. Uh, they've been transparent, and they're coming under enormous pressure uh, from the geopolitical fallout of this COVID, and I think it behoves us all to make sure that we support the WHO through very difficult times. Also pay tribute, Richard will talk about CEPI later, Isaric and indeed Lopidar, and the regulatory agencies. I'm not always necessarily positive about the regulatory agencies, as Marco knows, um, but I think they've been really uh, um, uh, flexible in the way they've worked. But what are the challenges? And I think the challenges we must focus on for another uh, minute, minute and a half. We, we've had 600,000 people die in six months. The pandemic is not coming to an end, it's accelerating. We've not yet seen the full impact of this pandemic in lower middle income countries, and that will continue to reverberate for many, many years to come. I don't think we've appreciated this interlocking four circles, the direct effect of the infection, the indirect health consequences, which drive inequality further, the third circle of the economic fallout and unemployment, uh, deficits, trade, uh, jobs, uh, etc. And then fourthly, the geopolitical fallout that inevitably uh, is happening now as people seek to blame others for what is uh, happening. We've had the politicalization of public health and the pillorying of scientists from around the world, uh, whether in the United States <coughs> or pressure on the WHO and others. And science has been thrust into the media with intense interest and frankly, sometimes has been left wanting. We've had scientists going out making claims that weren't true uh, were premature uh, and led, I think, to some quite damaging. And I think science has to look at itself in how it communicates, how it engages with the public, how it is true to its origins and the need for an evidence, and how it works at the policy science interface politically in a very, very tense uh, time. Um, I think we've found limitations in the way the global architecture works for funding. The World Bank and the IMF are there if on bilateral deals, but I am concerned that when it comes to non-national bilateral deals, we haven't had mechanisms to fund the critical research and development, particularly in lower middle income countries, and making sure things like the therapeutics and the vaccines, the diagnostics and the social science, PPE, public health, protection of healthcare workers, is not funded as a global public good, uh, but is funded through more nationalistic lines. And I think we have to find a new mechanism in the future for the way we address global public goods in an equitable way and doesn't depend on uh, how wealthy a country you are. So science is a little bit in the dock here, and I think we need to learn how to use science but not abuse it, and make sure that the public knows its, its positive contribution, but also its limitations. Chair, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Jeremy. So that was an amazing overall capturing of the summary of everything that's gone right and everything that's gone wrong. Richard, can I turn to you next, you know, from where you sit, uh, what's the last six months been like? And, you know, from your point of view, I know you spent two and a half years preparing for pandemic, but it's probably still came too soon. You know, so where, what are your thoughts in terms of some of the successes uh, from the global research community and the challenges that we continue to face? Sure, no, thank you. Thank you, Charo. And I have the unenviable task of, of following Jeremy. That was, uh, Jeremy, that was a, a wonderful summary, very eloquent, thoughtful, uh, in, in penetrating. Um, I just a couple of things maybe to, to add. I mean, I think in terms of, of the successes 
Um, Jeremy certainly has spoken to the unprecedented levels of, of scientific collaboration, uh, specifically within the area of vaccines. I know you probably discussed this in the in the vaccines day earlier, but the but the huge uh, rapid mobilization of, 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 of global scientific and industrial investment in vaccines now now numbering you know well over 200 vaccines uh, under under development uh, 24 I believe the last time I checked uh, already in the clinic within within six months that that is extraordinary the partnerships that have been established uh, a number of partnerships between academic partners biotechs uh, that CEPI has been working with uh, now partnered up with large pharmaceutical partners like AstraZeneca, Merck, CSL, GSK, and others. Um, that that has been tremendous. The the partnerships between the public sector agencies, I think, exemplified most strikingly by the um, assembly in 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 very rapid time frame, just in the order of a couple of weeks from conception to to, to global rollout of. The access to COVID-19 tools accelerator led by WHO, uh, with support of, of many countries and many non non uh, governmental partners, all all terrific successes. I, I would say, um, all of those successes speak to uh, population scientists, groups, organizations <coughs> um, responding in an ad hoc fashion to a challenge that should have been anticipated and has been anticipated and for which we have allegedly been preparing for years. And yet the, the actual necessary uh, instruments, organizational uh, alignments were not in place and we've had to assemble them on the fly. And that has been uh, terrifically uh, time consuming, terrifically challenging, obviously speaks to global solidarity in the effort, but uh, we shouldn't be in this position. I, I, I will say that the, the, the two areas that I would regard as the biggest challenges, besides having to assemble these uh, organizations, little alignments on the fly, um, have been in the area of funding. It is um, really disappointing that, uh, you know, we've had to spend as much time as we've had to spend on resource mobilization for a, a threat that was as anticipatable as this pandemic was. I mean, not only have we been talking about severe pandemics for more than two decades, um, we, we've even been focused on coronaviruses as one of the leading classes of threat. CEPI had invested nearly $100 million to develop coronavirus vaccines. Uh, we've only been in existence for three years. We've invested in developing rapid response platforms. We're not the first. Gates. Um, the U.S. government and many others have invested in rapid response platforms. And yet here we are, CEPI had to, in, in initiating its efforts, uh, had to borrow $100 million from ourselves and then begin fundraising from a cold start. And, and the instruments that were allegedly there to respond rapidly did not succeed in, in doing so, unfortunately. The other challenge, uh, completely anticipatable because we just lived through this 11 years ago is the challenge of access. Um, we have, this is the second pandemic of the 21st century, obviously. Uh, we faced the challenge of access to vaccine in 2009, again, with an ad hoc effort. People made best efforts, um, but too many countries had to wait too long for too little vaccine. Um, in, in 2000, Nine, actually 2010, because none of the vaccine was deployed in 2009, uh, 77 countries received 78 million doses. And those 77 countries had an aggregate population of, of well over a billion people, maybe 1.2, 1.3 billion people. And all of that vaccine arrived after the fall wave of the pandemic. Um, it, it, that experience, I think for those of us who lived through it, was searing and hugely disappointing. And it led to the early establishment of the ACT Accelerator. It has led to our efforts to stand up COVAX. Um, and I, I do have to say the global support um, that, that we are receiving in, in concept for COVAX and, and which has, has propelled us you know, to put it in place very, very quickly and to, 
and to begin to stand up the COVAX facility and uh, the AMC within the facility um, to promote vaccine multilateralism is hugely encouraging. I think, I think it speaks to the desire of the world to do better than we did in 2009, but we haven't succeeded and we have huge challenges in terms of execution, delivery, and addressing many concerns around funding ahead of us. Um, let me stop there. Um, I, that was more a recitation of my own um, joys and woes, and not quite as far reaching as Jeremy's, but I, I think it gives a, a good sense of what we're experiencing in the vaccine domain. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Richard. So definitely, uh, you know, an insight into the world of vaccines and the frustration of having the platforms ready to go and then having to do sort of the global coordination uh, and trying to get everybody on board. So Marco, maybe I'll turn to you next because, you know, what's it like from a regulatory perspective to have all of these, uh, you know, uh, um, expedited timelines, and what have been some of your thoughts on the challenges and successes? Yes, of course, I will, I will also express a bit uh, what has been my take so far and six months into the pandemic from a, a regulatory perspective, but also with intense collaboration with the research community as a whole, and of course with the private sector that is behind the development of, of many of the vaccines and therapeutics here. Uh, I think what has been great is, is uh, from the start uh, having a good intention from all the stakeholders really to come together and discuss together what would be the best way forward. And uh, I've been also privileged to, to be involved in the activities of WHO on both therapeutics and vaccines in the R&D blueprint. So it's been a great opportunity really to engage with the research community as a regulator and as a scientist in order to uh, help uh, streamlining and thinking what could be the best way forward for advancing uh, therapeutics and vaccines in the context of, of this pandemic. And I have to admit that uh, really the willingness of sharing data, sharing information, has been growing with respect to the past and I've seen really uh, positive uh, uh, trends here that I think we should continue to build on and even making stronger in the future. As a regulator also, uh, it's very important that uh, uh, also within the regulatory community that uh, uh, there is a good understanding as a minimum or even good agreement on the way forward because we always understood how it is important that regulators are aligned in a crisis like this one in terms of what are the requirements and what can be done here that is different than how normally we would operate and what are our standards and and, and requirements to, to developers. So here in this sense, I was very glad to see uh, um, the, the successes of uh, the ICMRA, which is this uh, organization uh, uh, including 25 regulatory agencies from all the continents in the world. So it's not an exhaustive one, but it's a very good example and in my view, a very good starting point for building really a global regulatory community in which we could bring together all the regulators from all over the globe discuss important matters like we just had a workshop last Monday on endpoints for therapeutic trials as an example but we had also a couple of very important workshop on the, the minimal requirement for advancing vaccines into phase one and then phase three and also about the design of the phase three studies which uh, we deemed extremely important uh, first of all to align the regulators in various parts of the world but also secondly to send uh, a, a common message to developers and other stakeholders around what regulators want. And this, I think, will simplify things for everybody and can allow then the development of the vaccine and the therapeutic to advance as swiftly as possible in order to get an approval at the end of the day, not just in one or two regions, but all over the world and really addressing the need and allowing access also in, in all countries. Uh, that, that require these vaccines and therapeutics. So I think from this perspective, really um, great advancement, great successes, and we really want to build on this and expand this. And I said also maybe to increase also the collaboration between the regulators and the scientific community as normally our developers or so the private sector is used to engage with the regulators, not as much the, the researchers and the scientists themselves. But here clearly uh, what we've seen is that the, the value of having in a more broader uh, coming together and discussion uh, within the scientific community and not just you know bilateral interaction between 
developers, regulators, scientists, developers, and and uh, and scientists and scientists. So so really, we have to build on this and to increase our capability of having a more uh, um, joined and. Uh, um, uh, harmonize a discussion on on the way ahead for advancing the vaccines and and therapeutics maybe on on the downside uh, uh, i think jeremy alluded to the fact that we've seen a couple of large clinical trials that 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 are, have delivered already important data, but on the other side, we've seen really uh, a tremendous fragmentation in the clinical studies and duplication even, because you know if there is fragmentation, but at least complementarity, maybe something good could come out. But here was even duplication with studies that we knew from the start were not leading to any useful results. And therefore, this is for me, one of the biggest areas that needs some reflection to think about how, what we can do in order to improve this in the future and making sure that uh, uh, there is a more coordinated approach and that larger and useful study will be conducted. And maybe my last point on the science is that just yesterday came out a paper from an in vitro study with hydroxychloroquine using the right cell lines, which was the epithelial lung cells, showing that hydroxychloroquine is ineffective. And I remember very well in February when we met in Geneva to discuss the R&D for uh, therapeutics and we were advocating for having such preclinical studies done at the earliest in order to inform them the large clinical trials. And unfortunately, these in vitro studies are coming after the large studies have been conducted. And I think this is an area that we need to address, we need to adjust, we need to be sure that whatever is bring into the clinic in large clinical trials is supported by sufficient proof of concept from preclinical studies or other pharmacology studies, or there, are, there is a risk really of misusing the patients and not doing the right study for the benefit of all of them and for the drugs that we need tomorrow. So I think I will stop here, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Yes, very uh, thoughtful. The, uh, the up and downside of uh, trying to do expedited work, you know, is, is uh, frustrating, but also leading to innovation. So Yasin, I guess I'll ask you, I'll ask you to ask the next set of questions, uh, you know, regarding some of the global efforts. Thanks, Charu. So, uh, so my first question will be to Sumaya, Sumia. So first of all, Hello, Sumia. It's, uh, it's uh, thanks a lot for being with us and thanks for joining us. So I don't know, Sumia, do you hear me? Yes, I do. I do, Yasdan. Hello. Yeah, it is a pleasure to have you. Thank you for, for, for being here. And I wanted also to echo what Jeremy said uh, to you and to WHO. Uh, for all the great job that has been done during this epidemic and it's not easy to be in the front line. We know that it's not easy and, and you are in front line in the world actually, not only in the country. So uh, uh, thanks again for, 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 for all the efforts. And so the question we wanted to ask you is what do you think, you know, so we will be in this and some of the panelists already mentioned that in this uh, where many countries were in a nationalist line. And uh, not only there were fragmentations that Marco said, but there was also this nationalist line, which could be sometimes understandable uh, within an epidemic. So the question is, what key research question uh, would benefit from an international scale effort over those other questions that can be addressed nationally. So the idea is to have it an equilibrium between national and international, and then to say this should be international. So what do you think that, what are the, these research questions? Thanks so much. Thanks Yazdan, and um, greetings to everyone, especially my fellow panelists, and congratulations to uh, Glopidar, uh, to both of you, Yazdan, Charu, and and the rest of the members of Clopidar for really having pulled this together. It was very interesting to hear the chairs present the, the uh, summaries from the previous sessions, and each of them made excellent points, I think. And of course, uh, Jeremy provided a really superb overview, I think, of where we are today. So just to reflect uh, a little bit, Yazdan, on what 
you asked me, but also on what the previous speakers have said, including Marco, we've seen the ups and the downsides of this huge amount of research that's happened in COVID. I mean, it's absolutely fabulous. Um, but then the downside is, of course, the variability in quality. Uh, and as Jeremy was saying, you know, scientists jumping the gun, coming to conclusions, um, results by press conferences rather than by peer-reviewed publications, uh, a lot of pressure on WHO and other agencies to act, sometimes based on press releases without us having seen the data. And I think in the area of clinical trials, we've probably had far too many clinical trials the vast majority of which have not answered the question that they set out to answer, either because they were designed poorly or because they just couldn't enroll enough patients. Um, and they, in fact, have confused, I think, people more than they have helped. And so I think the first thing I would like to, uh, the lesson that I learned is it's, it's better to have far fewer but well-coordinated, well-designed clinical trials that are designed in a way that's, you know, that is adaptive, setting up a platform where you can include new products as they come along. Um, and that's where I think solidarity and recovery were mentioned as the two trials that perhaps have been able to, to answer the questions that we set out to. Uh, there's, of course, a big difference between the two. Recovery, the recovery trial took off really fast. It benefited from the code protocol that was developed by WHO expert groups. It benefited from the NHS uh, having this uh, wonderful network of hospitals and being able to link research into clinical settings. The solidarity trial, on the other hand, uh, is a multi-country uh, trial currently with about 35 countries spread across all the different regions um, with an international governance body, a steering group, a central data safety monitoring board, and, and, an, and it has a democratic way of functioning, of course, with all the PIs serving on the steering group, and has now finished with the first round of, of drugs that needed to be tested and uh, is now exploring um, options. Now, it would have been great to have a pipeline of products, as Marco was saying, which had not by now gone through the preclinical evaluation, uh, perhaps phase one, if it was a new drug or a new compound, and then be ready now for inclusion in these phase three trials. But we're, we, we're not there yet. So I, I think this speaks to a little bit further for the need for global collaboration between the scientists who do the preclinical work. A lot of it, we know, is done in, in companies. Um, they, they have a lot of compound libraries. Some of them have made them available for screening. Uh, and the therapeutics accelerator is looking at, uh, at doing exactly that. The, the other question that I had for, for Clopidar is what has been your experience in the last few months of being able to coordinate yourselves on funding some of these large studies? Because I think the inputs that we had at the February meeting and uh, were excellent and the roadmap that we were able to come out with outlined all the priority research questions in many of the areas that we were hearing about just now. Um, but I wonder if that was actually followed up by better coordinated funding to avoid the kind of fragmentation that we were talking about just now. And I hope that when we look ahead to address some of the questions like the transmission questions that Marion presented, which needs a multidisciplinary expertise. It needs to be done in different settings. It needs very careful design, I think, to answer the kind of questions we'd like to answer. And it needs your epidemiologists, virologists, engineers to sit together and do that. And then I think this is a perfect example of a study that could be taken up in different countries and different settings and perhaps funded by the network. So what I would like to see also for vaccine uh, trials is this approach. Richard mentioned the solidarity uh, trial for vaccines. The idea is really to get networks to come together and, 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 and to form a, a consortium or a coalition of partners who would fund 
a multi-centric, multi-agent, um, uh, multi-vaccine uh, adaptive design in order to most efficiently and quickly answer the questions of efficacy and safety. We, we have a huge number of vaccine candidates coming through, which is wonderful. But if each one of them had to set up a trial of 30,000 people with placebo in different countries, you can imagine the complexity that that's going to involve. And, and, and the main thing is, I think, the epidemiology and the way it's moved around the world. And, and the fact that many trials could not be completed because those countries ran out of patients. So my plea and my, my hope is that we can work, CEPI, WHO, and Gavi, you know, form the vaccine pillar of, of the ACT Accelerator, that we can work with OPDAR in, in advancing vaccine trials in a way that's, that actually puts into practice, I think, what everyone on this, on this panel has been calling for. Thanks, Yaslan. Thanks, Sumeya. And uh, thanks a lot uh, for this excellent thoughts. And I think that you, you mentioned that uh, whether Globida has been able to coordinate fundings to try to avoid duplication. And I think that as all the things that have been done, we have had efforts at some level we have succeeded, at what some level we haven't succeeded. But I will keep what you said at the end. I think that if we can with you, WHO, work even closer, because I think this epidemic, we, we work much better together. And if we can work even closer, I think we can even make more progress. Uh, and I think the 29 funders that are around the table, uh, they are all uh, uh, willing to, to, to work more together and work more with WHO. And I think this is key, as you mentioned at the end. And again, thanks uh, for, for your thoughts, but we will come back to you. Uh, so now, Jeffrey, my, uh, my dear co-chair, what are your thoughts regarding uh, the key research questions that would benefit from an international scale effort? Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Yazdan, and uh, good afternoon or good morning uh, to all the panelists. Um, so this is an interesting question, and um, obviously, I think um, it, it depends uh, on the context. And uh, looking at uh, the nature of the pandemic and uh, the problems that we are facing at the moment, I would say what stands out for me is really, um, you know, the, the question of uh, um, health technologies. Um, I think uh, we need um, to really do um, these um, <clears throat> trials, um, whether these are for treatment regimens uh, or vaccine trials um, in different populations, uh, because uh, there, there is a benefit in doing that. Um, at the end of the day, uh, you don't really need a health solution that has been tested in one geographic area, and you don't know how it performs. Uh, in other populations. So th that for me is, is key, um, that um, we, we, we need to take into account that um, you know, different countries or different regions in the world have got distinct health challenges. And uh, as we test uh, these uh, future health technologies, we should take into account uh, this diversity. Then, <sighs> We, we, we haven't answered a lot of questions uh, and, and for, uh, for, for obvious reason, uh, we're dealing with uh, a new pathogen. Um, but in my opinion, I think um, we still need to answer the question uh, of uh, you know, the origin of the virus. Uh, because uh, if we are able uh, to do that, uh, we will be able to probably predict and, uh, and, and combat uh, future epidemics. Uh, if we if we know uh, the source of this virus, uh, the other area that um, is pertinent uh, is uh, the area of um, the the natural um, history of the disease, uh, because um, a lot is not known, and it appears as if uh, this virus uh, behaves differently uh, in different um, uh, geographic areas. Um, you'll find that um, in some areas. 
um, you know, children can be affected, even if uh, it's not a significant number, uh, but children can show some symptoms. Um, and and uh, in other areas, you'll find that um, very, very few children uh, get affected. And even if uh, they contract the infection, um, then, um, you know, the outcome of infection uh, is uh, just um, uh, a minimal and, um, and, and insignificant. Uh, so the natural history of uh, the disease uh, is still important to address. And um, I think um, every country will have its own distinct health challenges in addition to that, uh, to, to try and address, um, you know, the, 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 the virus in context of their own distinct health uh, challenges. So that, 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 that's how I see it, um, Yasden. Thanks a lot, uh, Jeffrey, and thanks for your thoughts. And I think that different settings, different priorities, that is also extremely important to be uh, actually keep and kept in mind. So next to Barbara. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, uh, so the same question, actually, Barbara, on the key research questions that would benefit from international scale efforts and also maybe to also ask you, I, I tried to respond in part, but to also respond to maybe the question by uh, Sumia on the role that Globetar can do to, to try to actually make this better happen. Thank you, Yaslan. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, uh, or even good evening, everyone. So it's a bit difficult to come in at uh, this stage and finding something to say that has not been said before. But um, I would say that in terms of uh, research questions that would benefit from um, international collaboration, one has already been mentioned, this is these uh, larger scale clinical trials, where it's, whether it's on therapeutics or on vaccines, that have to be coordinated worldwide. And that links then immediately to the points that were raised in the previous panel discussion, is agreeing on standards and endpoints. And uh, whether you then have one sponsor or multiple sponsors for those trials, as long as everyone can agree on what is meaningful and should be measured uh, over time, that would be a, a huge step ahead. But uh, in addition to that, and that is maybe because of my public health uh, background and bias, I, I think uh, we need this, this large effort on understanding transmission and stopping transmission, because that's what we're facing now, uh, will face for the next six months at least. And of course, vaccines are on the way, but I think the, the, the challenge lies in the fact, as was mentioned in the panel on transmission, that some of the answers need to be local and localized because the context is different, but you can learn from one another if you gather that evidence uh, across the world and you do the kind of outbreak investigation that where there's some basic agreement of what should be assessed to draw some meaningful conclusions. So I think there uh, it's, it's worthwhile uh, investing uh, more or in a more coordinated fashion. And then something that uh, we um, have not really in the context of Globetar uh, discussed, but it's everything uh, related to, and maybe I'm optimistic, but uh, recovering from uh, the pandemic, the effect, the, the long-term effect on, on communities, on individuals, on societies. Um, there are probably more in the field of social sciences research, maybe uh, that uh, needs to take place. But there again, it's so important to be able to agree what would be important to measure so that even if uh, individual countries or regions fund that type of research, you can get some comparable uh, data out of it. So uh, yes, and on, on your question, what uh, can uh, Globedar uh, do or, or has done and should do more or could do more? Certainly, of course, we, we, we work in close uh, collaboration with WHO and, and probably we can um, improve on that collaboration at a at, at more technical level, if you will. I think there's a, the very different issues that some people would call cross-cutting issues, but they are really about these agreeing on standards where uh, or on data sharing methodology or on data sharing platforms or on issues to be investigated that Globetar has started working on. And uh, we, we could continue and should continue uh, broadening uh, this kind of 
agreement. Uh, I think, Marco, uh, your, your uh, reference to the ICMRA is really inspiring. Getting uh, the community of regulators, not all of them may be present, but at least starting discussing. And I think uh, in other areas, Glopedar could facilitate that in collaboration with, uh, with of course, the work uh, WHO is uh, already doing. And I just will echo what others have said previously. So we are, you and your team and the global WHO team are facing incredible ch challenges but you, because you're both on the science side and on the implementation side and uh, you need to move that all uh, together up front. Uh, and then the last point I wanted to make is, is uh, I think uh, the, the um, accelerator, this, this whole international effort, uh, there's a lot of more work to do, but it, it, it's a good start and definitely, and maybe I'm too optimistic, uh, an improvement from uh, what happened, uh, let's say, nine years ago. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot, Barbara. Thank you. And, and I think that you, you're right. All the speakers in this uh, uh, small group uh, emphasize on the importance of international clinical trials, you, which is key, I think, to work together, not to duplicate, not fragment. You bring the transmission into it, which I think a big, big issue, the post-COVID uh, uh, and the impact of the COVID. And I, I, I think these are key questions that we have to all work together on. So thanks again to three of us. I give back to Charu for the next set of questions. I just wanted to, uh, to say that unfortunately, Michael Makanga has some technical issues and will not be in this set of questions. And, and sorry about that. Charu. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yasdin. So I know behind the scenes, we're trying to uh, connect uh, Michael back. He was having some technical issues this morning. So we're trying to see if as soon as he comes back, We'll invite him to give some remarks. Uh, so I guess uh, my uh, the, uh, the next round of question is really from a very research perspective, and I'm asking two people who are best placed to give those thoughts. So Marian, I'll start with you to give uh, some thoughts, and I know you've given some thoughts uh, to this. What are the most important research issues that we should be focusing on from your perspective of where we are currently at. And I know that you're coming fresh off of the transmission uh, session where this was a big uh, discussion topic. So, uh, so talk to us about a little bit about that. Um, yes, so um, as discussed there, so I think it's, it's really encouraging to see what the investments in the whole blueprint and CEPI and Globit has brought in terms of accelerating the vaccine uh, research, uh, some of the trial research. Um, I think we uh, lack a mechanism like that for the key uh, transmission research uh, questions. Uh, so, um, and that, that uh, uh, so there what I see and what I think is, is critical is to invest there because we cannot be sure that vaccines will be ready um, in a time frame that really will impact in the next year and maybe even longer. So the, there's, I think there's a critical need for uh, some essential uh, evidence base in, in the transmission arena um, for some of the topics that are constantly being challenged. Um, so, and, and finding a mechanism to do those essential studies uh, in the session that, that, uh, that I, I helped chair, um, someone, uh, Maria van Kerkhove said, we don't need these studies everywhere, we just need a few extremely well-designed studies that address some essential questions. And then, um, so what happened with the work streams that uh, Sumya helped put together, there has been a lot of discussion and good uh, ideas, but then everyone splinters off in their own research funding corner. So the real integrated collaborative studies are very difficult to, to get done and they, they should be done. They, sh they should be organized. Uh, key questions, if you ask me, are, um, on the one hand, are we not overseeing hidden circulation in some kind of evolving animal reservoir? Let's be sure that that's not happening. 
um, the battery of question about is there going to be immunity? What does it look like? Do we need to worry about enhancement? What do the kids do? Some very well designed targeted studies there. And these uh, key integrated uh, uh, out embedded outbreak studies that bring in new partners like the engineering uh, side, the, the, the ventilation specialists, the building specialists to help address some of those essential questions. That would be my, uh, my uh, answer here. And looking at uh, the role of uh, GLOBIDAR, uh, well, as I say, I think it would be good to think about a mechanism that is like that. So, so there's the prioritization debate and then there's SEPI when you talk about vaccines. Um, I think it would be very worthwhile to think about some of that for some of the key uh, evidence generating questions for the public health intervention because we need um, public trust is going to be one of one of the key pillars of uh, getting some handle on this uh, pandemic circulation and wherever there's lack of evidence and lack of confidence that public trust is very difficult to to build um, aside from the social uh, science aspects of it but i leave that to nina so yeah perfect transition so uh, nina we've seen uh, you know in this pandemic social sciences and social behaviors have uh, played such an important role and to this date you know we are completely reliant on that in terms of controlling the pandemic so uh, you know same question to you you know from your view what are the most important areas uh, in social sciences research that we should really be focusing on as we move forward at this point thanks charu and and it's a, it's a pleasure to be to be with you um I'm a social scientist and so I would say it depends on who you are and where you are in the world and what are the key pressing issues um, in front of you. I think when it comes to social science, it is really one of those areas that localization and setting local priorities is absolutely key. I mean, having said that, of course, there are some broad areas that we should consider and my background is public health and, and health uh, services. And so I'm coming at it very much from that angle. And I think that research to strengthen the public health response at every stage of the pandemic is absolutely key. So Jeremy made a point around how things are changing, people are adjusting to the new normal, but those questions around how we engage with our populations and our communities to be uh, our partners in following physical distancing, wearing face coverings, complying with hand hygiene, remain absolutely critical questions. But of course, you know, we need to be thinking about the context in which people live and we need to understand, you know, what are the contextually and locally relevant, acceptable and accessible solutions um, for people. And we can learn an enormous amount from people working in the humanitarian sector, who, of course, are working with these kinds of challenges uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Vaccines. I've been surprised at the lack of conversation around social and behavioral aspects related to vaccines. You know, we really need to invest time and energy into preparing our populations to receive vaccines. I know there are groups working on that, but we need to accelerate those conversations and we need broader conversations across disciplines around vaccines. We need to be talking about access with our populations, acceptability and uptake. The public have a role around vaccine uptake and it's critical that we gain their trust and confidence and we really need to be doing that groundwork now, doing the formative research, reaching into different social groups, understanding what they think, what they believe, what they need, you know, where would they go, where would they feel comfortable to go to receive vaccines um, and how can we at this stage be exchanging information about benefits, risks and supply and so on. I mean, another area, of course, relates to the secondary impacts, not only of COVID-19, but also of uh, public health measures. We've talked a lot about this. We've talked a lot about the disproportionate, the uneven impacts of COVID-19 um, across many social groups across the world. Um, I'm particularly interested in thinking about the impacts on health services and how we start to think beyond the uh, COVID-19 health needs. 
you know, in many parts of the world, COVID-19 is just one of uh, many health and humanitarian crises, in fact, that people are facing. And so we need to be adopting a much more integrated lens when we think about uh, tackling the COVID-19 challenges. And finally, I think what I would say is that this is not just about what research is done, but it's also about how it's done and how it's used. And so we need to think not just about the evidence that's produced. I think at the moment there are over 500 social science studies that have been funded uh, under the, that have been recorded on the, on the UK CDR tracker. Um, and we need to think about the back end of that research. How do we get that evidence to the decision makers in a form that is usable to them and useful to them? And I think that there are many questions around the uptake of evidence in this response. There's many ways that evidence has been used. Uh, we need a better understanding around that. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily the sole responsibility of research teams um, to be doing that. So that would be sort of my, my overview, my perspective. But I would say that from the session on Tuesday with the social sciences, that um, Christy and Ken led, there was a very strong call for localization of agendas and for research priorities to be specified by affected communities. And I think that is right and fitting at this time of the pandemic. Thanks. Thanks, Nina. Uh, very thoughtful as usual and uh, really some key points here. Uh, so Yastin, I'm gonna hand over to you to do the sort of the quick round of the specific questions before we go to the audience. So uh, if you wanna get going on that. Yeah, thanks, Charu. So basically now the idea was to ask you a quick question. So if you can respond really to, to them less than three minutes, actually it would be great because uh, 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 I think it is great and we have uh, uh, very interesting discussions, but I think also it's important to have to get to some of the panelists' questions. So it will be great. So I will start then with uh, with Marco. So Marco, uh, basically we 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 talked we talked about this fragmentation of the uh, clinical trials data, um, and we talk uh, about, of course, what is. As Nina said, it's not only clinical trials and, and vaccine and treatments and therapeutics, but for you as a regulatory agency, I see mostly for clinical trials around uh, uh, safety and efficacy. Uh, uh, and the question is what you, you, and also at the national levels maybe, in discussion with you, we can do uh, around the globe to try to coordinate at the level of the regulatory authorities, uh, uh, maybe better and more robust evidence to be obtained from these trials to expedite uh, approval for vaccine and treatments. So what are your thoughts regarding that? Yeah, that's a very important topic, but also a difficult one. And of course, you know, we are talking here about the global situation, but I can tell you in Europe, we miserably failed uh, in, in trying to avoid that a huge amount of small trials were approved by the national authorities uh, without really thinking about what you will get at the end of the day. So, so the problem is that uh, regulatory authorities, particularly in a crisis like this, but I would say in general, should look very careful at what the trial is uh, trying to achieve and whether it will be uh, providing important information on safety and efficacy that could lead then to an approval of, of a therapeutic or a vaccine. Otherwise, we may think that this is a bit of a, of a wasted effort. And, and sometimes uh, the authorities that approve clinical trials don't take this whole picture into account and, uh, and just, you know, base the decision on the, whether there is sufficient protection of the participant in the trial, but not thinking about the big picture and what you will get out of this trial. So we tried at least in Europe to bring together all the member states to make sure that we are more consistent and that decisions are really taken in the direction of only generating evidence that could lead then to a potential approval. But I think it's still a long way to go uh, which means that we still have to work hard in making sure that in the future, uh, really the design of the study should be really looked uh, uh, with the perspective that we want this drug to be eventually approved if it proves to be successful, both in terms of efficacy and safety. And we need to expand this, of course, at global scale. Uh, 
Uh, one of the issues that came out uh, here, as I said before, is that many of these uh, uh, trials were not uh, sponsored by manufacturers, were not sponsored by the private sector. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, academic people are not used to talk to regulators, are not used to deal with what to really put into a trial and what you will get at the end of the day, because they will be, not be the one then coming for a potential market authorization. And, and we need to solve this issue. We need to think how we can do better. And uh, in my view, the first thing is really to um, engage more uh, between the researchers and the regulators so that there is a common understanding of what can be done. Because at the end of the day, what we want is the th same thing. We want access to drugs and vaccines that are effective and safe. Thanks, Marco. And I really think, because Sumaya asked the question, I really think that this is an issue where cross-cutting issue, where, where maybe Glupidol can play a role because there is, and, and Barbara actually mentioned this, there is huge, I, I saw huge heterogeneity even in, between the European countries. And I, I think that EMA has also an important role to play for that. So I, I really think that we should identify this as something to really move faster and to less fragments. Charu, to you. Thank you, Yazdan. So the next question is for Jeremy. So Jeremy, uh, you know, as a large, uh, head of a large uh, philanthropic uh, organization that has played really key uh, role in global coordination, uh, where do you think is the place for large philanthropic organizations like Welcome or BMGF and how do you see that uh, coordinate with national funders? I know we've had some of these discussions during the Glopidar co-chairs, uh, you know, but uh, your thoughts in the context of this pandemic and uh, how can we avoid some redundancies and, you know, have more synergies? Yeah, thanks. I, I'm, um, I'm perhaps gonna talk about what I think philanthropy should do, not necessarily what it has done. Um, because I think this, this this event, which we, you know, we hope will be one in 100 years, but may not be, has to force all of us to challenge what we're doing and ask whether it's the right things. Uh, and if we go back after this, whatever after this means and whenever that is, to the way we're doing things before, we'll learn nothing. So I think it's more about what philanthropy should do. I, I think philanthropy um, is there to do a number of different things. One is to work quickly. And, and philanthropy should not be bureaucratic because we fully appreciate that government funding uh, that is taxpayers' money has to have a certain degree of bureaucracy and checks and balances. Philanthropy doesn't necessarily have to have that. And, and we're not big enough uh, to do what government funders can do. But what we can do, and we, or at least we should be able to do, is move quicker uh, with less bureaucracy. Um, uh, we should be able to take greater risk. Um, we should be able to do a longer term that is beyond the political uh, cycle. We should be willing to partner with others uh, transnationally uh, because national funders often can only fund within their own jurisdictions and, and that is a limitation we have to respect. Philanthropy doesn't have to be limited by that. Philanthropy should be able to work across all sectors, whether industry, academia, government, civic society or others. And academia, in my view, should be able to work across the sectors that we've heard of that are currently fragmented and where it has an influence to try and break that fragmentation down in universities and academia and think forward, not, not backwards. Um, and I think part of the role for this is to rethink public health. Marion mentioned the article that, that we were part of writing uh, in, the, in November of last year. That lays out a view of what the future of public health is. And it, include social sciences, architecture, design, transport, and other things. And if we want that, we're going to have to break down the silos within academia and within industry. And that is something that perhaps philanthropy can pilot uh, and can work towards doing to, to get come out of this better than we went into it. Over. Thank you, Jeremy. <clears throat> as usual, uh, good thoughts on what should and could do. Uh, you know, as national funders, many of us are thinking the same thing, what we are doing and what we could do that would improve and coordinate better. So Yasin, I'm going to hand over to you for the next question. Yeah, thanks, Charu. So Nina, uh, we have already talked about this, but to be more specific and maybe to, to, place, to put some more time. 
So this pandemic has happened in the digital area where uh, information is shared instantly and Sumaya actually uh, mentioned that, Mayon during her talk mentioned that. Uh, of course, this is good uh, uh, for information, but it's also misinformation. And uh, I have been thinking to, to this all the time, I mean, all of us, I think, yeah? the good sides, the bad sides, uh, have you been within social science thinking it of the best ways? Because all of us at night when sleeping, we are saying how we can try to regulate this a little bit, to not have also, because I don't know how much is misinformation, how much is information. So have you tried to, 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 try to think about it, how to promote better, accurate information on this. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nina. Yeah, thanks, Yasin. Look, that's a great question. And I think when we came together in February to talk about, um, you know, what our research priorities might be at that stage, this was already a growing topic. And this was already something that we said there needed to be, you know, a lot of attention on. And um, we do know a lot about how to promote good, good information. And we continue to learn a lot from many di disciplines. And I think this really is an area where we need to come together in an interdisciplinary way. Um, in fact, this month, the WHO has hosted a conference doing exactly that. They brought together researchers and practitioners from many different disciplines, from media science, epidemiologists, data scientists, applied mathematicians, engineers, and so on, um, to look at these kinds of questions and to really advance the field in thinking about how we develop a common language across these disciplines and how we can tackle the infodemic. Now, from a behavioral science point of view, which is really my background, there is a lot that we know about promoting accurate information. You know, we know the ingredients, but there is no recipe book, I'm afraid. So we know we need consistent, clear, and relevant messages. We know we need accessible messages, but we think about the needs of the people that we're speaking with. You know, we need to think about the social and political context of the people that we're speaking with. We need to use the right language. Semantics matter. The words that we use matter. But there are also social processes. So trust is important. Uh, you know, leadership um, is important. Leaders and influences are important. Social values are important. People are sharing things on social media because they have a so they value social desirability. Um, you know, and they are wanting to express their identity and be part of an in-group, right? Um, so we know these things, and there's a lot of emerging uh, evidence from many different people who are working, you know, quite in, in a very focused way on this. But I think we urgently need interventions, and we need ways to sort of disrupt these flows of misinformation. And there are interventions that are being developed, looking specifically at ideas around, for example, uh, developing digital literacy. Um, and there are some sort of promising indications that, that, that these kinds of interventions can make a difference. So. Um, we're on the road, watch the space. Many, many people are coming together working on this and it's, and it's gathered really good momentum. Thanks a lot, but I, I really think this is a huge, I don't know around the world, but here in France at least, I can see that something has been broken between scientists and the general population. And because of all this misinformation, and we really need to, to try to put a mean term intervention. It should not be short term, it should be mean term information to try to, to, to impact this. Th th thanks, Nina. Charu. Uh, thanks, Yazdin. So, uh, Richard, can I ask you a little bit more about uh, CEPI's partnerships? You know, so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great enterprise, uh, fast moving agency, public partnership, private partnerships, governments, COVAX, uh, you know, what, what is the plan and do you actually think that the uh, whole goal of equitable access around the world is actually going to be realized? You know, is, what are the challenges that are there that once there's actually a vaccine in sight, people are going to stick to these plans? Uh, you know, we are already seeing, you know, some countries sort of go off on tangents. Uh, you know, as soon as something looks efficacious. So what are your thoughts and are you worried? Are there challenges? What are those? Well, I mean, I mean, of course, I'm, I'm 
worried. I, I, I think the, uh, you know, I've, I've talked in other fora before about the challenge that um, the pandemic presents absent mechanisms like COVAX to incentivize multilateral cooperative behavior. The challenge that the pandemic presents is, in my experience, um, the best real world illustration of a prisoner's dilemma that I've ever seen, which is that countries left to themselves with the responsibilities that they have domestically to their own populations, um, pursuing a rational goal of serving the population that they serve will collectively uh, end up with a, a massively suboptimal outcome because of the nature of the problem that they are trying to defend against, which is an inherently transnational, inherently global problem. But if those countries that have the means use those means to protect their populations, it results in misallocation of vaccine, which leads to perpetuation of the pandemic, extra uh, mortality, significantly extra mortality, millions of extra deaths probably, and a prolongation of the economic disruption. And the problem, having lived through this, serving uh, you know, in, in the Obama White House during the last pandemic, the, the problem is a structural problem within governments, which allocate tasks to domestic agencies, the typical ministries of health that focus on domestic responsibilities and are single-minded about pursuing those responsibilities and allocate other tasks in terms of international cooperation and collaboration, if that's even a governmental priority, to different parts of government. And those, the only place where those come together tend to be at the very top of the administration, where there often isn't a deep understanding in, of certainly of this particular problem. And so an ability to think holistically about how to design solutions that would offset those internal tensions that produce vectors of governmental action that actually don't serve the purposes of the government or the people that they serve. Um, so it's, it, is a, inher it is inherent to the, the way we have organized ourselves globally that we would face this prisoner's dilemma and it will take, you know, enlightened leadership, brave leadership and uh, concerted action to promote multilateral cooperative solutions. I mean, one of the things that I have, have said about um, you know, the, va the vaccine is what, why are we developing the vaccine? We, we are developing the vaccine to end the pandemic and the pandemic is everywhere. And the pandemic, the, the impact of the pandemic is a result of the ex excess morbidity and mortality that it produces, the disruption of healthcare systems and, and the cascading disruption of, e of the economies. And then as Jeremy has pointed out, which leads to geopolitical tensions. And so if governmental leaders will recognize that the reason we are developing vaccines is to end the pandemic, then the question becomes, as long as vaccine is a scarce resource, how do we allocate that vaccine to achieve the end for which we're developing the vaccine? And the only way to do that while the vaccine is a scarce resource is to manage it as a scarce resource and to target it to the populations who need it, and they're everywhere. And, and, and so I actually think that if you can walk governmental leaders through this, and we've been doing this with our presentations on COVAX, they actually understand that and they, and, and, and they can see that doing the right thing, doing the, the thing that is appealing from a humanitarian perspective is also the efficient thing where, where ending the pandemic is concerned. But it, there's, a, there's a chicken and an egg problem between setting up a system to do that and having people buy into that system and trust enough that that system will serve their needs to, to then take the actions and make the investments that would be required to result in equitable distribution of vaccine globally. Um, so I, I am both extremely encouraged by the response that we've received. I mean, just over the last week, we, we have engaged in country consultations and we had a, about 150 countries participate in those country consultations 
And what we heard was enthusiasm, hard questions, but a, a desire to find a way forward. Um, and, and, and now we need to take all of that input and, and, and see if we can come back and address the, the, the very reasonable questions that governments have. They have to balance their obligations to their domestic populations with their desires to work collaboratively to end the pandemic as quickly as possible. Um, in terms of the CEPI partnerships, and I'll, and I'll, I'll be brief here, I know I've, I've run a little bit long. Um, this, the CEPI partnerships that we have established are, are you know, designed to create commitments and obligations from the companies that we are working with to working with the, the multilateral facility that we have been putting together with WHO and with Gavi under the ACT Accelerator. And um, the challenge that we have had and, and, and where my biggest concern comes from is that we have had to build this in real time during the pandemic and think through these problems in real time during the pandemic. And that has taken time and securing the resources is taking time. And what we are now seeing is governments getting nervous particularly as the first sets of data become available. And I think governments are, are very apt because they aren't expert in vaccine development to overinterpret phase one clinical trial results as suggesting, oh, here we have a successful vaccine without understanding all the intermediate steps, including manufacturing and scaling up and phase three clinical trials that need to be successfully conducted to, to demonstrate that you do have a vaccine. And so now you are beginning to see countries rushing to put in place um, agreements, which of course leads to anxiety and um, similar types of, of you know, collective behavior on the part of other countries that have the means to do that, which is exactly what happened in 2009 and is exactly why 12 or 15 countries cornered the global market on vaccines in 2009 and led to the massive misallocation of vaccine in 2009. And I am very concerned that because we aren't quite at the point where countries are signing up to COVAX, I think it's coming very soon, but that we're, we're behind where we should be. And there, there's a great potential over the next six to eight weeks to you know, have things go in a direction that would not lead to the kind of equitable global access that we have been wanting to promote. Over. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, so lots of uh, things to think about and, uh, you know, always this balance of domestic and national ag agenda with the, the more global and humanitarian need uh, and the importance of convincing so many people in, from so many po uh, political stripes that uh, what's the right thing to do. So Yazdin, I'll hand you uh, next to ask the next question. Yeah, thank you, Charu. So the next question is to Marion. So Marion, uh, you have always telling us, and I completely agree, you are pushing us on the importance of transdisciplinary research. And the fact that we should uh, come out of the vertical, actually, uh, way of doing things and to be much more horizontal, I completely I, I agree with you. Do you think that we have succeeded or do you think that we haven't succeeded during this epidemic to do that? And if you can do that in three minutes, it will be great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, short answer, no. <laughs> Few exceptions. Um, and I think, I have been thinking about this. Um, I think the, the need for it is blatantly clear during this pandemic. It's everywhere. Uh, and it's, it's fueling also the public debate by scientists, the engineering scientists that speak up because they don't agree with the decision making that's being made based on more uh, the, 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 the traditional uh, way of looking at uh, uh, epidemic spread, things like that. So um, I think the need is clear. The mechanism is not yet in place. Uh, and I also think we have to be realistic that during what is a very disruptive uh, period, 
it's extremely difficult to start doing multidisciplinary because multidisciplinary takes time. It, it means you have to get used to each other. You have to start understanding what, what are you saying? That's crazy. I don't get it. I have the time to have those, to build those relationships. Um, but having said that, I think um, essentially uh, that you, you can force multidisciplinary collaboration a little bit by saying it has to be done multidisciplinary. You don't, you don't get funding if you do not have you know, the proper uh, composition uh, of a team that, that you promise will be doing the research, that kind of thing. Because other than that, I, so this has been mentioned in many different evaluations um uh, and then uh and then that dies off and we are in the next outbreak and we mention it again but what we need is a mechanism in between so okay so what do, then does that look like can we start doing that with just a few examples where the the focus is on uh interdisciplinary experiments to see how to actually do this because it's very difficult. Uh, I've been involved in a five-year European project saying something very simple. Okay, we see the NGS revolution. We think we need to capture that and see how it can be used for clinical, public health, and research applications. Everyone enthusiastic agreed. It took us years to understand what the other groups were saying. It took us years. And that's the kind, so it's a long-term process that needs a long-term vision and investment in the type of sort of integrated research uh, uh, that also has the speed that it needs when there is a crisis, when there's an outbreak. So that would be... No, no thank you. And I think that you have been pushing this for a long time. This is something that we have started, tried to do, you know, we said that we should have this cross-cutting project within the epidemics. And I think you're right. We cannot become multidisciplinary in the middle of a crisis. So the problem is, I think that the experiments, and I, 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 I'm, I'm glad that the discussion is there and the experiments are, are there, but the translation currently is mostly, uh, additional projects to coordinate efforts mm -hmm. so it's adding layers of meetings uh, to people that are already very busy trying to get things addressed rather than enabling the joint up thinking working uh, figuring out what needs to be addressed and i think it's very difficult but trying to figure out a mechanism to 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 stimulate that kind of work is is still uh, my top priority yeah thank you and thanks Marion. um mm, charu do you michael not being there you want me to follow with sumaya sure okay so sumaya to come back to you know one of the topics that we have discussed here was transmission and this is one of i and i think again the, what was presented uh, on Monday on transmission and, and the summary of which Marion and David actually presented was quite uh, surprising. We have the impression, of course, we have done a, much, a lot of progress in understanding SARS-CoV-2. But uh, uh, there are many things we have not been understanding, actually. And uh, the infection is spreading, it has been said by Jeremy, uh, at unprecedented levels right now. Uh, we have things like, you know, saying that it may be even a bit footboard. Oh my God. Uh, and so what do you think from the WHO, what is the WHO advice for researchers and, and for public health on, uh, on, on what we should focus to try to, to to stop transmission at this point? I know it's not an easy question, but I, I just want to have your, your feedback on that. Thanks, Sumaya. Thank you. Uh, 
Yes, Dan, it's not an easy question and I think it will not be very easy to design the studies that are needed to actually answer the, the question because what, what, do, what do governments want to know now? They want to know what works in the short term till we have a vaccine and till you, know, you can get people, enough people with immunity. Local governments are really struggling to know how to deal with this and particularly in the low middle income countries where it's impossible to really implement physical distancing and the kind of lockdowns that have been imposed at such enormous cost to people uh, increasing you know jeremy has, has pointed out that the uh, you know the the collateral damage that has happened to livelihoods to all the other health problems that people suffer from. I don't know, at the end when we add up, I, I'm not sure that uh, those won't be more than the mortality due to COVID. We just don't know because we don't know what's happening and nobody's counting those other things. So I, I think we haven't touched on health systems issues at all. We've limited ourselves mostly to biomedical, but of course I'm very happy that social science and Nina gave a wonderful overview and I think it intersects with some of the things that I'm saying is about public health measures, which depend a lot on people's cooperation and behavior change in this case. And so, so there are things that governments do and there are things that people need to do and, and there are things that you have to do as communities and you have to, you have, to have things that encourage people to, to um, or enable them to follow those very strict uh, restrictions and guidelines. So I think if I was a, a, a commissioner of a city or if I was heading the health department of a state, that would be my topmost question to researchers. Schools, you know, shops, offices, public transport. How do I get these things working and back again with minimal risk to people? And I know that there have been modeling studies. In fact, we've had loads of modeling studies in this, in this pandemic. And uh, as my colleague Mike Ryan says, all the real epidemiologists have disappeared and, or they've morphed into modelers who produce lots and lots of papers. But, but again, modeling really depends on the assumptions. And unless you have good data feeding those models, you don't know what you're looking at. So we've had models looking at which public health and social measures have had more impact but I, I don't think we have the answers yet. We, we still don't know a lot about transmission from asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic people and how we could minimize that. And then I think about immunity. Uh, the, recently, I, I saw the results of the survey from New Delhi where they found that 23% of the citizens of Delhi have uh, antibodies. And it's amazing to me because they've only had 100,000 uh, a little over 100,000, I think 120,000 diagnosed cases and, up, and under 4,000 deaths. So if 5 million people in Delhi, because Delhi has a population of 20 million, are infected and the mortality has been about four, four, five thousand, 5,000, uh, even if there's some errors there, it you know, can't be wildly off, you can double that. The infection fatality ratios is still you know, around or below 0.1%. So what's, is, is, I don't know if the test is okay, but presuming that the, the antibody test they used was okay, I, I have my doubts about that. Um, would really want to double check. But we've seen uh, in other cities as well, uh, about 10 to 12 times the number of people infected as those who were actually detected. Um, and so I'd like to know a lot more about the epidemiology of this infection. Um, and it, how it spreads. And then of course, follow up cohort studies, you know, to look at immune responses. I think that's going to be so critical, including for vaccine development and vaccine rollout. So some really carefully done studies of, of follow up of cohorts. And again, this would be ideal for um, a core protocol type approach where different funders could fund the same protocol in, in different parts of the world. And then you could compare and contrast the um, environmental and um, social and economic 
uh, factors and how those might be impacting on transmission in different places. And also this differences in mortality. I mean, I think this has been, uh, I, I get asked this question all the time. Why is mortality rate quite low in Asia? If you look at deaths per million, it's much, much lower than it's, it's been in, in Europe and in the Americas. And is it human genetics? It's clearly not the virus, not that we know. You know, what, what, what else is it? I mean, it's, it just can't be poor data alone because it's impossible to, to really hide deaths on, on, on a scale if they were happening. So there could be some undercounting of deaths, but that can't be the only explanation. So I think these are things that I don't have answers for. And, uh, and I hope that researchers are gonna look at those. But I, I, I would like to end by saying the health system issues and, and how do you deliver primary health care? You talked about digital technologies. Do we really have best practices? Which countries have been able to continue delivering health services? Uh, because it, the survey that WHO did showed that over 80% of countries that answered the survey had disruptions uh, in most essential health services. Uh, and so to me, that's a really big worry. Thanks a lot, Sumia, and thanks again. <laughs> for your thoughts for, uh, uh, and for your uh, uh, extremely important points. Um, Charu, so I give you back the floor. Yeah, thanks Yasdin. So, uh, so I'm looking at the questions and I'm not seeing a whole lot of questions. We are also very tight on time. So keeping in mind that everybody's time is really precious, uh, the Coordinators are telling me that they will try to get answers to the audience questions, uh, you know, after the session. Uh, so I guess uh, given that we have 15 minutes to go, uh, we can start the final round of questions, which is basically a one minute sum up of, you know, what for you is the answer to these uh, couple of really key questions. Uh, so I guess I'll go back to Jeremy with this uh, final thoughts on this for one minute. In your view, what is the best exit strategy from the current stage of the pandemic, Jeremy? And I know it's a difficult question, but you know we have some of the world's best leaders and thinkers, so we didn't want to just give you easy questions. <laughs> well, continued lockdown and physical distancing is not the exit strategy. Um, it's not sustainable, it's not equitable. Um, and so we have to think beyond that and, and whether that, that will in the end be a combination of, um, yes, behavior change, yes, the critical importance of, of social sciences, uh, enhanced public health, protecting healthcare workers, that hasn't been talked about very much, but was a debacle early in this pandemic and has to get better. And then ultimately accessible diagnostics, so we know what's going on, understanding the epidemiology and critically interventions. Uh, those are not just treatments. Uh, in terms of specific drugs. They're also making sure we have oxygen, making sure we understand fluid replacement and all the things that are important, prevention as well as treatment and also vaccines. And ultimately that will be our exit strategy. Thank you, Jeremy, always succinct and to the point. So uh, Marco, what, what are your thoughts? <clears throat> what do you think will be the best exit strategy from where we are currently in the pandemic? Yeah, I think, Can you hear me? Uh, yes, so uh, yes, I think it's multifactorial, but of course, if I have to uh, you know, uh, take one that would be particularly impactful, of course, uh, the, the availability of safe, effective, and accessible vaccines will really be the one I would point out. Um, thank you, Marco, very succinct. So Jeffrey, what are your thoughts, uh, especially from the point of view of, you know, where South Africa and many of the global South countries are at this point? What, you know, do you see an exit strategy and what do you think will apply to the populations that, uh, you know, some of the things that Sumia said they're experiencing? Um, thank you. Uh, I, I can only add uh, to what uh, the other panelists have already mentioned. Uh, definitely vaccines are important, uh, but uh, we, we don't know how this uh, first generation vaccines will, be for, um, will perform. Uh, so that's uh, a big question mark, uh, because uh, if uh, the efficacy 
uh, may not necessarily be what we are looking for. Um, so vaccines will just be part of the solution. And, and I think uh, this is an important uh, thing for governments to keep in mind uh, that vaccines may not necessarily be you know, the only solution. Uh, perhaps uh, we need to really emphasize the point of uh, international collaboration uh, because um, we, we, as long as uh, one country or one region um, is not safe, um, then the rest of the world is not safe. Uh, so researchers should continue to collaborate and, um, and, and um, even you know, political leadership should continue to collaborate across the world uh, so that uh, whatever response um, the world will uh, eventually uh, implement uh, is something that um, um, is, is, is a concerted effort. Uh, so that, that would be my thoughts. Thank you, Jeffrey. Really important point about uh, you know global coordination and everybody understanding that without everybody on board, you know this pandemic is not going to end. Uh, so, Marion, can I ask you for your thoughts? You know, from your perspective, what do you think is the exit? Uh, your question was from the current stage, and my direct response was, I don't want to exit there because that would mean we move into the next phase. But um, I think uh, we need relentless effort to find ways to reduce, through vaccination, through treatment, through interventions. That's the one arm. And the other arm is public trust. Invest in that somehow because we are going to be in here for the long haul. And we need to figure out how to work with this constant debate, constant challenging in a constructive way. Those would be my two key uh, uh, elements. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Marianne. So, uh, Yazdin, the final, final question for you to moderate. Yeah, so uh, I think that the question I'm going to ask is much easier than the question that Charu asked. Uh, so the, the question, so I will start with you, Sumia, actually. What would you tell the 29 and even more because there are not only funders here who attend this meeting that should be their top priority uh, at this stage of the pandemic, the research priority for the funder. Thanks, uh, Yazdan. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I hope that, um, you know, as we've said before, it's, I know it's hard, it's difficult because every funding agency has their own rules and uh, you know, their own national uh, regulations and needs. But I hope that on a few key topics that the 29 agencies could come together and decide that they can invest in a coordinated manner, in a uh, not pooling uh, of resources, but you know, using a common protocol or deciding that um, a mega trial, you know, deserves uh, funding from each of the agencies. It could be therapeutics or uh, vaccines. It could be the development of a of a novel diagnostic and antigen detection. Uh, rapid assay would be would be great. I mean, I think we've heard from all the sessions today. So I don't want to repeat the research priorities. But I think there are a few global questions that came up that we need to know. And it does not have to be done in every country. Um, but it, it definitely needs quick answers. We, we do not want you know, a whole lot of poorly designed or small studies that don't answer the question till we finally get around to doing something the right way. So I, I really do think that even if it's three or four of the top priorities that have come out of all of these discussions that there should be an effort for the Glopidard network to, to jointly fund. And the second thing, of course, is that there are national priorities, there are contextual issues, there are things in, in countries that, that, uh, that need answers for, and as I said, policymakers want, want some answers pretty quickly. Um, and, and then one issue that I think was mentioned is about the data sharing. And we've made an effort to pool data, especially when we 
see a large number of small clinical trials, uh, you know, the only way then is to do meta-analyses, pooled analyses. So we've We've attempted to do that for dexamethasone, for hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, because that's the only way to go ahead with um, treatment guidelines. Um, but again, if you have, if you have a, a, a core protocol, if you have well-defined endpoints and well-defined uh, clinical criteria, then you could, it's much easier to pool data, but if every set of investigators is going to design their own data collection form, then of course it becomes impossible to try to pool at the end, and it's a huge amount of work. So again, the WHO did put out a lot of model protocols and case report forms, both for adults and children. I think, I'm not sure children was mentioned at all, but I would like to uh, say that uh, there's been a rather limited research on children. We, we know that there's mix, but the role of children in, in, uh, in actually spreading the infection itself uh, is another question. But the point I wanted to make is, again, common data collection forms, which are, which are pre-designed and agreed upon, and a data sharing, data pooling agreement between the 29 funders to enable this huge database. For example, I think unless you have the... Um, the kind of database we have of genetic sequence data in GISAID, unless that's linked to clinical and epidemiological data, we can't answer some of these questions. And, and every other day you see a report from some corner of the world saying the virus has mutated, it's either become worse or less this thing, and this is why this place has less mortality, the other place has higher mortality. We don't have a global database that combines genetic data of the virus and the host and epi and clinical. And those require, those require all of you, the 29 funders, to decide to do it. And I think that would be a huge gift that you could give the world right now. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Maya, uh, uh, for that. Uh, Nina? I don't know if Nina, do you hear us? Hi, yes, then, yeah. yes. Thank you. So. So I, I think I would like to make two reflections, and one of these sort of came up really in in our in our discussions on Tuesday, uh, and that is not to not to focus only on COVID nineteen. That we need to think about this as our new normal. That there are many other research programs. I think about TB programs, HIV, chronic condition programs, cancer, and so on. That we need to find a way of accommodating and restarting. Um, these other research priorities in the context of COVID. So I think that was something that came through in, on, on Tuesday and, I, and I'd like to sort of just raise that at this stage. For me, the second question has to do with knowledge mobilization and how we really make sure that out of these 500 plus social science studies, you know, we can find a way of channeling that evidence to where it needs to get to. And I really want to thank the Glopidar Social Science Funders Forum because we are already having those conversations you know, around the funded portfolios and how do we then work together to make sure that we can bring that evidence to where it needs to get to. So I'm going to end Thanks. there. Thank you. Thanks, Nina. Richard, if possible, less than one minute because we want to finish on time. Okay. Um, thank you. Very... Uh, Quickly, I'm going, to, I'm going to reframe the question slightly. Uh, we often think about research priorities in terms of their instrumentality uh, to achieving an end. And, that, and by what I'm going to say, I, I'm not meaning to discourage the instrumental research at all, but I would uh, encourage the research funding bodies to also think about the window of opportunity that the current moment presents and the kinds of research that can only be done in an environment like this. These are very rare. In, in 2005, 2006, when we were thinking about non-pharmaceutical interventions and how to combine them, we only had one uh, historical example to look at, which was the events in 1918. This is a, a unique moment in terms of studying transmission, epidemiology, social science, behavioral science uh, across the board. And there are things that we can only gather information on while we are in the midst of this. And we do need to prioritize those things that we will have want to have known and understood um, and, and, and do those things now while we have the opportunity and not to miss that opportunity.
Thanks a lot, Richard. Thanks uh, for your uh, response and for your comment. Barbara? Sorry. Yes, I wanted to say uh, two th to make two points. So in terms of uh, advice or orientations for the Glopidar funders. One, in terms of, of new investments to be made. Indeed, look at the UK tracker that has a pre that where the, the priorities are set against the uh, the blueprint, but also look beyond that to what came out of, of uh, the last uh, four sessions. But then in terms of the investments made so far already by the, by the groups, we need to do more in terms of uh, overcoming some of the barriers. So it is about discussion on these standards and the endpoints. It is also about uh, data sharing. Uh, we've set up a data sharing infrastructure, but other funders have done so as well. And this, we need to capitalize on these investments and make them work together. Uh, Mayan mentioned uh, this need for transdisciplinary research and we need as funders to make it happen by asking this to be done and facilitating that process and that is something that we can discuss together. The work uh, cohorts were mentioned and that is an unexplored area in terms of mapping so far what are the current the cohorts that are out there. So basically it's two things about new investments let's make them strategic and capitalizing on the investments made so far and then for those investments already done at multinational level, work towards moving the field towards making better use of the data that are collected. And uh, as was mentioned as well, I think it's important to look uh, at the health systems component of things. And that's a whole area of research where, where lots can be done. So these would be my takeaways. Thanks a lot, Barbara. Thanks to everyone. I'm going to give the floor to Charu uh, to to end uh, with the closing of the most. I wanted to, before that, thanks really everyone. Uh, uh, I think there were great uh, discussions and I, I wanted also to really thank those behind the scene, uh, Gail, Josie, Claire, Evelyn, uh, Debbie, last but not least, uh, Geneviève, Abdel, uh, uh, Jason, uh, Debbie, everyone, really thanks a lot for all your work during the last and specific thanks to Charu for a huge amount of work. Thank you, Charu. Thank you, Yasin. So uh, again, I'll add my thank you to the panelists. I know that you are sort of in the center of leading the global response to COVID. So heartfelt thank you for, on behalf of Glopidar for taking the time to spend this time discussing your thoughts with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, you can rest assured that we are actually taking copious notes of the forward moving agenda. Uh, so the idea was to actually come together and basically get your thoughts on where we need to go next. Uh, that will be done. I'm making my own notes, but I know that there are dedicated note takers. A lot of about global coordination, team-based science, data sharing requirements, clinical coordinations. You know, so those are all things that uh, we as funders really need to think about and. Uh, maybe move into the next generation of uh, funders' responsibility to encourage this rather than single PI individual-based science, which you know, is not really working that great in terms of uh, creating redundancies uh, in the context of this pandemic. So thank you all and uh, apologies to the audience for uh, not attending to all the questions that were there, uh, but rest assured we will be handling those questions as well. So thank you. Uh, again, and uh, um, hopefully we will have a good agenda coming out of this. Thanks, everybody.